Titus de Souza has been the assistant producer. Dave Rhodes, Tech Up Dave, uh, has been the technical operator. Now, Sir Avanchi has been the visual producer. Parik Birmingham has been the video editor. And thanks as well to Phil Dave, who has been the weekend editor. Petri's next between one and four. I will be back tomorrow between 10 and 1. I'm also here actually on Monday morning for breakfast between 7 and 10. And indeed on Tuesday too, between 7 and 8, I'm going to be on prime time filling in for uh, Rosanna Lockwood. But um, I'm off for the rest of the day. I'm obviously going to be listening to Petri on the way home. And uh, she is here between 1 and 4. So stay with her. And I'll see you tomorrow at 10 o'clock. Thanks so much for your company. I'll see you tomorrow. This is Talk TV. This, my friends, is Talk Today with me, Jeremy Kyle. And me, Nicola Thorpe. We're here! Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. <laughs> I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. <laughs> Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV. <laughs> Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you should have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about weirdest plank that we've had in what, yeah. three years. Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. He's on <laughs> yeah. This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares uh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing interviews. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. Look, I'm getting ready for my new primetime show on Talk TV and Radio. 7 o'clock Saturday night, James Whale Unleash. I don't need you coming in here, following me around with a cow. I'm so sorry about this. Saturdays at 7 on Talk TV. Hi, good afternoon. Serenaded by Chesney Hawks.
and I got a sneaky kiss as well. I mean, all of my drip. That's the best Christmas present I've had this year. Absolutely amazing. So make sure you don't miss him if you're going to go down to the uh, uh, New Year's Day parade because he will be there and uh, singing and live and lovely. He's very, very sweet, you know. Uh, anyway, coming up on this programme this afternoon, I'm with you until four o'clock. Uh, we're going to be talking... We've got so much to get through, actually, because there is a lot to talk about. One of them is a shocking, shocking story about the NHS, which I believe the organisation has completely overstepped its original remit, uh, and doctors too, to do no harm. It is shocking, and you'll want to stick around to find out the details of that. I've been appalled. Um, we're also going to be talking about how Britain now has taken over the rapid response responsibilities from uh, NATO, so if there's ever any issue now with NATO countries, it is the Brits that will steam in first. Uh, so we're going to be talking about that a little bit later on. Also going to talk about hedgehogs. They discovered five new breeds of hedgehogs without prickles. If you've ever seen one of those, they're not hedgehogs. They look like mice or shrews or something. Anyway, we'll be talking uh, about hedgehogs a little bit later on. Josh Rom will be in to go through all the celebrities that we've lost this year. And it seemed it was rapid fire, wasn't it? It was one after the other after the other. I think it's because all these sort of legends have reached a certain age. Uh, so um, we're going to be talking about that. The Work Well scheme as well. One of my favourite uh, political people, Stephen Pound, is going to be chatting about that. The Work Well scheme, if you've not heard about it, is the idea by this government that people who are not at work, he's calling it a national scandal, so many people are not working, that he's going to get you to join jogging clubs. I wonder how much that's going to cost. So we'll be talking about that as well. Uh, but kicking off, uh, first of all, this afternoon, prisons. Now, we often talk about prisons, don't we, and prisoners and punishment and the justice system and whether it's fit for purpose or, or, or any of those things. But it's long been believed that education, training and rehabilitation need to become the primary focus of jail. Uh, the chief inspector of prisons in England and Wales has said, Charlie Taylor, has said that a fundamental reorientation of the prison system was the only way to reduce offending. Now, you can't disagree with that, can you? Unless you see prisoners getting uh, a, a free education, uh, maybe a college education or a university education level. Even, it, they may even just be learning to read and write for free. That might annoy you. Is that enough of a punishment if we turn prisons into educating centres? Or don't you care? Do you think, well, look, the fewer victims there are, um, the better. So we need to do this. Let's talk now to Alex South, who's an author and a former prison officer. Uh, Alex, thank you for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, so, look, this is... This is um, it, it feels like a no-brainer, and I just wonder why it hasn't been done before. I agree. I think there's been so much rhetoric recently, hasn't there? around is punishment the most appropriate thing? Is it control, compassion, rehabilitation? But I don't actually think that you can have any of them if you don't have education, decent training, decent skills provision. I mean, you mentioned earlier, what exactly is it that we hope to have? We want less victims in society. So I think we need to do something in prison that adequately contributes to that. We need people to leave prison with the skills to help them desist from crime, because that's ultimately what's gonna to lead to less victims. Certainly in my opinion, having spent a considerable period of time in prison. Not only does it make life a lot easier for the staff, it gives the prisoners a purpose to their day. It gives them a way to engage with the outside world, to learn when they're obviously very restricted in doing that inside. So it makes things flow much more functionally in prison. And that's the kind of atmosphere you need to encourage someone to leave and contribute to society in the same way. What level of education are we talking about? I mean, the reason I, I mentioned university, and that might have made you smile, uh, level university, because I remember when the student riots uh, happened, there was a young man who did something extremely wrong and he ended up in prison. And the country paid for his university education, whereas all the kids that didn't break the law 
had to pay for their own and go into debt. So there is a sense at some point that justice has to be served as well. But uh, talk me through about what kind of education are you thinking about when you hear that? Well, it's really dependent on the kind of jail that you're talking. So when I first joined the service, I went to a high security men's prison. The overwhelming majority of guys there were lifers. So the average sentence on my wing was around 27 years. And in that prison, they did facilitate open university degrees. So postgraduate education across a whole range of subjects. And like you say, it was for free for the prisoners. And it's a really contentious issue, and it should be, especially considering how much education costs for people in society. And I don't think you can get away from that. It's always going to rub people up the wrong way, and understandably so. I think, I mean, at the time I was at that prison, I was actually doing an open university degree myself. So I remember having very similar feelings to the ones you've just described, that I was paying however much a month, and they certainly weren't. But I saw the very real immediate impact of that. It benefits people in prison, and I believe that it honestly benefits them outside as well. If we have people leaving prison with very little skills, a very little way to get them a job, and that's the big thing here that we're talking about. People don't have jobs to get, people don't have access to those opportunities. They're more likely to commit crime. But having said that, I then moved on to a short term as jail in central London, where there was little to no provision for education. And the irony of that is that this was a short term prison jail. So this is where prisoners can be released in anything from two weeks to a couple of years. But there was no provision for education for them. So the irony of that is we were giving the long-termers, who had a minimum of 25, 30, some over 40 years to serve before they were released, they had access to really high-quality postgraduate education. Whereas the guys who were getting out in a couple of months had little to nothing. And I think that indicates how fractured our system is at the moment. If we want to do what actually works, we need to implement that in our prisons and in the education departments. It, it is a, it is a really like you said it's a contentious issue and a, and a difficult one because it, you you do have people who say well look my my kid has never broken the law um, uh, you know he or she has been a victim of crime uh, and they are having to pay for their own education whereas the perpetrator of that crime is going into jail for six years and is getting free uh, post grad. Uh, a degree or you know I, and and uh, that actually is galling it is galling when you, you you're a taxpayer uh, your whole family have been working and paying tax and you've got a situation where the victim of the crime is paying for their own education and the perpetrator of the crime is getting a free education that is annoying yeah, absolutely. I mean, even as you're saying it, I can feel myself kind of Getting reacting crossed. in that way. It is annoying. Yeah. I it know. is. I, you know, you... Sorry, go on. And I was just going to say, well, how, how, do we, how do we convince people that, that prison shouldn't be about punishment? That they're really just well, in like a boarding school? I mean, you know, uh, where people have to call them by their first name, they get a lovely, they get to play pool in the evening. It, it does sound like a private education, right, to some degree. Well, I can happily dispel that notion for you. <laughs> prison is absolutely not like a private education. Prison is absolutely not a holiday camp. I think sometimes we come to it with a really binary view. So prisons are either very soft, overly compassionate, they're having degrees, they're having pool tournaments in the evening. Or there's the other aspect of it, that they're really tough regimes enforced and characterised by punishment. That's not what prison is like. It's not a case of only having one and not having the other. You can still provide someone with decent training, decent education, and still robustly challenge poor behaviour. You can still have very firm regimes. You can still have very clear demarcated uh, consequences for violence, for poor antisocial behaviour. And our system is very good at that, you know, and that does absolutely go on. It's not a case of... If you are compassionate towards someone's situation, then you therefore condone their crime and condone any poor behaviour in prison. I think what we're trying to do is blend punishment because that's important. It's important for society to see that, particularly with really abhorrent crimes. I mean, we have the, the full life sentence that demonstrates that clearly. So punishment is important, I think, symbolically for people to see that as well. But I think if you just have punishment, if you just stick people in a room for 24 hours a day, if you have them in very poor conditions, if you offer them nothing, then what honestly do you expect to happen when they're released? Because they will be released. Life sentence prisoners do get out. It's not an indeterminate sentence. So I think the broader question has to be, 
what is it that we want? And we talk about victims of society and thinking that that's unfair, victims of crime. What do those victims ultimately want? Of course, punishment. So they should. That's right and just. But I think most people would say, and I also don't want them to do it again. Mm. And we have to look at the evidence of suggest what actually works, what's effective. But locking people in dark rooms for, you know, days, weeks, months on end, it doesn't work. And I know that because I've been there with the 24-hour bang-up regime in, in two of the prisons I worked at. It doesn't work. What, what are, could we start... Um... Uh, because uh, because that that dichotomy between victim and and perpetrator, uh, just saying uh, supporting victims in the same way that we're we're trying to support prisoners uh, because you know victims will find it may find it difficult to go to walk into a college because they've been traumatized or they may find it difficult to get a job because they've been traumatized, um, uh, particularly a violent crime or sexual crime, and yet the victims. We, we pay lip service to the idea that those victims support. There really isn't. Uh, it is not as good as the support and the bleeding hearts that we see that gather around prisons. Well, I absolutely agree that victim support is really lacking. I think that goes without saying. There's some really amazing third sector organisations that try to fill that gap. But that in itself kind of identifies the problem. There is a gap. The policies aren't there to fill it. Um, I don't know if I agree with the second part of what you said, that people are sort of, of gathering around prisons. I mean, trust me, prisons are really tough places to be at the minute, and that's evidenced by the amount of suicides that we have, not just with prisoners, but prison officers taking their own lives. Um, it's evidenced by the fact we can't recruit staff, we certainly can't retain them. The uh, rates of staff sickness, staff suffering very serious traumatic and mental health-related issues, that evidence is the fact that not only are these extremely difficult conditions for prisoners to be living in, but they're really tough conditions for officers who you're hoping to do this transformative, meaningful, life-changing work, and we're asking them to work in very poor conditions. So, But, but we I have to be careful. You. We have to be careful, don't we, that that um, what we're not doing is giving these, these prisoners an education to make the prison guards' life easier. In a sense, you know, if, if prisoners are easier to control because they're on drugs, we hear, uh, then 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 there's a blind eye turned sometimes to that. Um, yeah, I, I did a phone in once where prisoners were explaining to me how they how they got things into prison, and uh, it was the it was the funniest and uh, uh, <laughs> shocking phone in I've done in my career, I think. Um, it, so it, 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 again, the public wouldn't be forgiving of that. Yeah, I mean, I agree with what you said about the contraband. I certainly won't look at a, a dead pigeon in the same way as I no, used to. Or, or a small mobile game. phone. Uh, Smaller than that. Yeah, yeah, you don't want to know where that is. <laughs> I, I, found, <laughs> I found out. Yeah. <laughs> having said that, I, you know, I don't know who's told you that having lots of drugs in prison makes prison easier. It absolutely does not. Lots of drugs in prison makes them extremely dangerous, makes them extremely dysfunctional environments. The kind of violence that I have seen come not just from immediate drug usage, but the bullying that that entails, the subculture that goes on. Mm. You have um, one prisoner I met in one prison, he was pretty candid with me and said he was making upwards of four grand a week. And so in while he prison. might be making a lot of money from it, okay. imagine the problems that then come with the amount of people who owe him money, the amount of people who can't get that money, the amount of people who want to rob him and take that money. It leads to enormous levels of violence, bullying. It leads to suicide. It leads to prisoners, prisoner on prisoner homicides who are under the influence of drugs or have drug induced psychosis. How is it impossible? How is it impossible to stop to stop it? I mean, this is, they're supposed to be stopping things getting out, but it seems that there's no thought given to stopping things coming in. Absolutely. I mean, one of the prisons that I worked in, it was a Grade Two listed building, which meant that we, they couldn't make modifications to the exterior, so there were no cages on the window. So weekly, we would see drones arrive, and they literally just drop off parcels. So the idea that, I mean, obviously, I mentioned dead rats, dead pigeons, they would be gutted, filled with drugs, sewed back up. You know, it's, it's not for want of staff not trying. You can have all the staff in the world running around every day, but if someone can literally just guide a drone to a window and drop something off, we need something bigger than just the individual motivation of officers. We need policies to support that. We need mm. decent infrastructure. Yeah. We need, you know, actual modifications made to buildings that are not fit for purpose in contemporary society when people can operate these kind of drones so it's it's really it's a really difficult one but you know trust me drugs make prison dangerous they make prison frightening 
they cause people to inflict serious harm on others they cause people to leave prison with worsened addictions or addictions that they didn't have in the first place which as we know drug fuels crime mm. the idea that drugs make make prison a, a calmer place and that officers are turning a blind eye i haven't met those officers <laughs> that's certainly not my experience I mean, that is fantastic to hear because then I will be able to, I'll be able to quote that because I've always, I've always wondered about, you know, people if they're smoking weed, but you can smell it. I mean, just walk down Notting Hill, um, but you know, <laughs> and, and how that isn't stopped, you know. But I, I guess they're vaping it now, or they're finding uh, different ways to do it. It's been fascinating to to talk to you, Alex. Uh, did you pass your open university degree? I did, and I went on to do a masters. Yeah. Oh well, well done. Well done. If only, if only we could have paid for that for you, that would have been nice. <laughs> <laughs> Alex Sal, thank you very much indeed. She's an author and a former prison officer. What do you think when you hear all of that? Do you think actually it's a good thing? We, we need to stop with the thinking about punishment and get on with providing these prisoners with an education so when they come out, they can get a job, there won't be any more victims, etc., etc. I find that a little bit galling, I, I, and I know the logic of it. I know logically that makes complete and utter sense. But it kind of feels like an easy ride, doesn't it? It feels like we'll break the law and get a free education. Stay honest and pay for one. I don't know. Do you tell me what you think? 0344 499 1000. I'm going to take a quick break, but back in just a moment. We're here! Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. The amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you should have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares oh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast ah, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Just Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? with you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that.
Hi, good afternoon. It's Petri. I'm with you until four o'clock. I've got some messages here because we've been talking about the recidivism rate, the reoffending rate, uh, and how we stop that because the reoffending rate in this country is huge, and we need to better prepare lags. My favourite word in the English language, lag, uh, prisoners for. Um, a life outside of prison. So if you've ever been to prison, uh, would education... I mean, it seems like a daft question because obviously the answer would be yes, but do you wish that you'd got an education while you were, you were in prison? I mean, I think a prisoner doing a master's degree or a doctorate uh, seems a bit going a bit far, doesn't it? If, if they're in for 25, 30 years, I mean, what are they going to be able to do by the time they come out? But... Um, do you think that it's right that we pay for this level of education? That's not cheap, OK? I mean, you know, somebody going to university now will come out of university with a 50 grand debt. Whereas somebody coming out of prison who does that degree comes out with a zero pound debt. And that, for me, I can't... I can't quite reconcile. Um, and I know I should. I know logically I should. But um, give me a call. Did you get an education in prison? Are you glad you got an education in Britain? Did it help you uh, keep away from crime? Listen, give me a call. 0344 499 1000. I appreciate that you may not want to give your real name if, you're, if you've got a job now and you don't want your colleagues to know. Um, I'm more, we're more than happy to change, change your name, so don't worry about that. Um, uh, some messages here says any investment should be spent on victims of crime. Uh, prisoners, if fit, could be used on various projects, mending potholes, etc. Not a chain gang as such, but heavily supervised. Um, that's from Don. Chris says, stop the bleeding heart liberal stance on criminals and uh, make prison a lot more scary and fewer will go there. I visited a prison in Egypt. Nobody goes there twice. Few break the law. The UK prison I visited was luxurious by comparison. Well, my producer <coughs> has uh, done uh, some research on this because it's often perception is different to reality. Recidivism rates amongst Egyptian ex-convicts overreached 34.6%. In contrast to the UK, in 2021, the rate was between 24 and 32%. So a harsher prison did not stop that criminal element. In fact, more people reoffend in Egypt with that harsh prison sentence than in Britain. Also, the prison population in Egypt in 2023 was 116 per 100,000 of the population. Uh, in the UK, it's 143 per 100,000. So the prisons here are much more crowded. Uh, the USA, which has a harsher prison system than the UK, uh, it was 531. So the USA has an incredibly harsh prison system, uh, and it was 531 per 100,000. So, uh, and in Norway, which has a very liberal prison system, the rate of reoffending was 55. So, the more liberal, the more liberal the prison, the less reoffending there is. I mean, those are just the stats. So what do we want? Do we want punishment? Or do we want low reoffending? So it's a no-brainer, really. Those figures are mind-blowing, aren't they? Uh, right. Let's have a look now at the New Year's Honours list. Uh, because that has uh, come out. And I'm so pleased to see <laughs> that Shirley Bassey has finally uh, got an award. So let's uh, let's talk now uh, to Richard Fitzwilliams, who's a royal commentator, about this uh, this list. Um, Richard, thank you for joining me. 
Well, I'm very happy to, and I also join in saluting Shelley Bassey, one of our top singers, a companion of honour. Now, that is a particularly significant award. There are only 65 of them, and uh, she will be absolutely thrilled. It salutes a brilliant career. Is she friends with King Charles anyway? Were they mates? I don't know that they have a particular friendship. I mean, this sort of aspect of it is something that people often speculate on when they're talking about the honours. For example, the Archbishop of Canterbury has uh, the highest award that you can get in the Royal Victorian Order, which is in the personal gift of the monarch. The only previous Archbishop of Canterbury to be knighted was Archbishop Fisher, who officiated at the Queen's coronation. Now, Archbishop Bishop Welby officiated both at Queen Elizabeth's funeral and at King Charles's coronation, and it's known that they are friendly. To what extent that played a role is, of course, something that we can speculate on. Yeah, and I wasn't suggesting there was any sort of, you know, brown envelope thing going on, but it just because she does deserve it, uh, Shirley Bassey. Um, do you think there's anybody on... Has he done well? Do, do you think uh, has a king done the right thing here in 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 sort of um, uh, picking some people that we might not ever have heard of and choosing some people that have done good works quietly uh, rather than going for those obvious names? Well, I think it's important to stress that there are nine committees uh, who make these choices and they have advisors. They're not headed by civil servants and we know who is on these various committees. Now, there's, the honours in the gift of the king uh, involve uh, the Order of the Garter, Order of the Thistle, the Royal Victorian Order and the Order of Merit. The others are in the um, gift of these nine committees and also advised by government departments and experts. Now, I think overall we've got some 1,200 names. Uh, the 56% this year, quite considerably down in previous years, it does vary, but the accent has tended to be on philanthropy and doing good, and the majority of names fall into that category. There are 48% um, in the overall of, for women and 42% in the senior honours. They wanted or would hope to do better, and some 15% uh, or so from ethnic minorities. Uh, the balance, you could say, uh, overall, I think, gives a tremendous amount of pleasure. So a huge number of people. And I think you've got some big names, which always helps. For example, Sir Richard Scott, uh, he's, he's gone up uh, the one in the um, Order of the British Empire. So for those who, and he's had his detractors, but no one handles screen spectacle like him. And of oh course, no, absolutely. Yeah. And that was for services to the UK film industry, which of course brings in billions of pounds to the economy. So, it, it, you know, it's, it is good works as well. <laughs> Oh, it is indeed. Amelia Clark, the actress uh, who I remember most fondly from Game of Thrones, uh, she and her mother, they uh, both have MBs. I think it's the first time this has ever happened. And this is for uh, charity. So uh, you get a complete mix. The youngest, I think, is nine year old, and the oldest is 97. So it's certainly putting it mildly. The honours, I'm Michael Evis from Glastonbury. I think uh, people will applaud that. And uh, there are quite a large number of well known names in some of the lionesses, too. But I think there's also a control. Obviously, and this brings in a serious issue, how you deal with it, and that's Liz Truss's um, resignation honours list. Now, whether there should have been one, since she was only Prime Minister for 49 days, you could dispute. And also, there are mostly political names of the 11 uh, chosen. And I think, again, the problem is that this has overshadowed the names on the list that, you know, that no one would have objected to. I think everyone would agree, Julie Cooper, Michael, Evis, uh, uh, quite a large number of individuals, Judith Weir, a master of the King's music and so forth. These are well-known figures. Yeah, Will Tony Blackburn um, and, of course, our own James Whale um, as well, uh, pulling an MBE. Paul Hollywood, I think, that's a bit weird. Well, there are large numbers of them that, you know, that individuals would like or dislike. Yeah. And 
some people uh, are far, you know, on a very, very late. It's very difficult in the system. Uh, they do their best to divide it into the different categories. If you consider one, sports honours were uh, so difficult to obtain, and uh, then suddenly, when they tried to make it a go uh, um, MBE per gold, uh, Olympians and Paralympians surpassed all expectations, and indeed no system could have coped with it. So it, it very much does depend on the overall feeling towards the list. And I think I like what I like are the, the grades. They encourage initiative, they encourage incentive, and this encourages people to do a great deal more. And this is also a, an honor system that, you know, we give honorary awards to uh, those from friendly countries who've done a service or perceived to have done a service to Britain. And I think overall that the system does tend to work well. There's some 2% refuse. I mean, the late poet Ben Zephaniah brought up the issue of uh, the order of the British Empire. Mm. And I suspect at some point that will change. If they were going to change it when they brought the British Empire medal back in 2012, it was Dave under David Cameron. They should probably have done it then, but I suspect that will change in a future time and you've had the likes of Ken Loach and Paul Schofield uh, and so forth very large number over the years have refused but sometimes they've refused because they wanted something better <laughs> yeah. I shall I shall turn down an OBE. I'm waiting for my damehood. Uh, just just so, just so you know, uh, Richard. Thank you very much indeed for that, Richard Fitzwilliams. Who really should have a uh, an, a nod, a gong of some sort as well. Royal commentator there. Um, well, somebody else who should have a, a gong is my next guest because I want to talk to you about the idea. If you're unemployed at the moment, and maybe you're off sick. Um, and you're, maybe you're off on long-term sick. Would joining a jogging club be just the thing to get you back into work? Because Rishi Sunak has described the number of people who are economically inactive as scandalous. But is it scandalous to force people who may well be sick to consider joining a jogging club? Uh, that's just one of the options uh, available. This is called the Work Well Scheme, and it is there to help reduce the numbers who have signed off uh, with job centres encouraged to refer people for advice and therapeutic recreation. I can't think of anything less therapeutic than going for a jog. Uh, well, joining me now to uh, discuss this is uh, Justin Urquhart-Stewart. Um, Justin, where's your honour? Petri, good afternoon. No, no one's going to give me anything. I'll be lucky if I get a Tesco card. <laughs> well, I think you deserve one. Who's that you've got with you? Uh, this is Boo, who for some reason does uh, has insisted on staying with me. I'm trying to put it down, but she keeps crawling back up my leg again, which is quite painful, actually. Yeah, that, that is painful, especially if you're wearing a kilt. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Uh, Justin, um, look, th th there, is a, there is a huge number of economically inactive people at the moment. Um, how do we use the carrot and the stick to get them back into work? Is this, is this, I've heard of schemes like this before and they haven't worked. No, they mostly, they, well, it's a lovely idea, a lovely concept, but there's no simple answer to this. Basically, what happened after, after COVID, we had so many people who were signed off, and it's a problem not just for us, but actually throughout the whole capitalist world, people haven't come back to work again. And so we've now got a position of something, say, 2.2 million people um, signed off as long-term sick. That's an astonishing figure. So what do you do? Well, the world, bear in mind, we've had another wave of COVID coming through. So actually, before you all say that uh, these are just all malingerers, that may not be the case at all. No one really knows all the figures. But what is something we really can't afford and you see the figures now for disabilities um, have actually gone up now. What was the last figure I saw? It was about £91 billion pounds a year. That's up 75% in a couple of years. And to put that into perspective, that's nearly, what's the defence budget you say? £60 billion? Um, So £60 billion on defence and £91 billion on, on wow. the... Wow. Um, but but it's really going to be... We can't afford to carry on doing it. So anything which can encourage people back, it's got to be good news. But some of the, these schemes do seem a little harebrained 
and they're going to take an awful lot of effort to be managed individually well, that's going to be quite expensive in itself. Well, exactly that. And, and, and also, we've had this sort of social prescribing uh, thing for a while now, and, and I haven't seen any figures that have rapidly uh, turned around people needing actual NHS care. And this is the, the, the nub of it, isn't it? That many of these people, some of them will be malingerers and skivers. Yeah. We know that. We're not naive. But, but perhaps there's, there, there are many more who are waiting for treatment, mental health support. Um, you know, depression is one of the biggest reasons that people aren't at work. So where is that, where is that support? And, and like I said, waiting for appointments yeah, to get your back that, fixed or whatever yeah, it might be. All those elements, if they, they need to be coordinated together locally. You can't really do this nationally because there's no one single scheme that will work. And it has to be done individually. It takes time and it costs money. But when you've got numbers like this coming through, 2.2 million on long-term disability, um, and yes, you say there will be some malingerers in there. The other side you can also try is actually with tax incentives to get people back into work again, to actually make it worth their while. There's always a slight view is that people have decided not to go back because they can't be bothered. That's unlikely to be the case. Most people do want to work, but they want the money because they've got to be able to pay the bills. Um, what you've got to do is actually try and give them more incentive to do so, and so if it helps with training courses and things, things like that, then so be it. But um, just merely a large scheme like this is a very good excuse to actually recruit a load of consultants uh, who are going to be better off as a result of that. We don't actually reduce the number of people back in work. But that, that's the thing, isn't it? That any money, so we haven't seen the figures, uh, they, they're deliberately, I think, being kept from us at the moment, but, but how much this will cost is likely to go to to organizations who will be set up to take in i don't know ten thousand people to go go running and they'll take in 10. Uh, <laughs> and, and there will be no judgment on that they'll get we know this happens with government money they get paid the same whether they get you know, ten thousand or ten people that there seems to be very little scrutiny over the costs of something like this well, you've seen already with what happened with all the uh, materials for COVID for hospitals. Oh, yeah. And the provision of plastic equipment. So uh, the government panicked, put up the orders, didn't bother to check anybody, and lo and behold, we get mightily ripped off. Mm. Um, and mm. this is another opportunity for that to occur. Now, look at the areas where actually you're getting most jobs being picked up again. These tend to be small businesses. That's the biggest employer in the country. Help small businesses to actually get going. Well, they're actually getting going because uh, the startups are increasing. But actually make sure they've got uh, more access to uh, some uh, medium-term finance, which is an area we're very bad at in this country, to help them grow. We've got a lot of this based around technologies, all around the technology centres all around the country. That's where you're actually going to be seeing the growth. So encourage those companies to grow. They will actually get more people going back in again. Um, and you can try and do that. But um, you know, well, um, uh, well, schemes with a good intention may be, of course, a very good idea but actually prove to any of us that they're going to work on any such scale. Leave that to local bodies, local authorities, because they can do it according to local elements. So trying to do that on a national scale, I think, is will be a disaster, an opportunity for, again, yet, yet again, for us to get ripped off. We yeah. don't have the tax money to do this. So work the other way around, encourage more people into work, more companies to set up, give them the tax breaks in terms of actually investing. If they're investing, they're going to be employing more people, and actually the, the, seems, the system doesn't solve itself, but it's a more practical way of going about it, and why you really like to get better value for your money. Yeah. Well, listen, I'm going to set up a running club, because uh, we're neighbours, pretty much. So um, I, I reckon if we just it's run... a very from, slow running club. If we, if we just sort of run from your place to the pub on the corner... That's <laughs> too, too far. 100 yards, I can't. Uh, too do far, that. okay. Uh, well, we'll walk. We'll set up a walking oh, club. Yeah. And Bo is welcome to. Uh, Justin, happy new year to you. <laughs> oh, hello, Bo. Oh, now, <laughs> now he wants to go down. Um, <laughs> Justin, thank you very much indeed. A happy, Thanks, very you. happy new year to you. And I hope to see you soon. Uh, Justin uh, Stewart, the economist and business professional. So, are you somebody who's on long term sick? I, I don't know how people are going to be persuaded to do this. This is what concerns me. The devil is always in the detail. So if you're off on long-term sick and somebody says, right, you've got to go running, how are they going to make you do that? Or how are they going to make you join some therapeutic, <laughs> easy for me to say, therapeutic uh, pastime? I don't know. Are they going to be able to force you to do it by taking benefits away? Like I said, the devil's in the detail and we haven't got any of the detail. But give me a call. 0344 499 
1000. I'm going to take a quick break and then it's over to you and your calls. We're here. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi Sunak the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you should have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares oh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Are Listen you prepared you. to call is Hamas possible, a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you discussion can't, can with you? you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. Hello, good afternoon. It is Petri here with you until four o'clock and uh, we're just sorting out some of your calls so I can have a chat with you uh, about some of the topics we've been discussing. And one of them, of course, is uh, the work well scheme. Uh, Minister, I wonder if it will work well. Um, to reduce the numbers signed off uh, sick. So job centres and bosses will refer people to therapy or running and gardening clubs to keep them well enough to work in an attempt to tackle long-term sickness in the benefit system. I think we've seen this before. That's, that's the problem I've got with this. I think we've seen this before in the sort of uh, social prescribing that GPs were meant to be doing. Anyway, uh, we thought we'd talk to Stephen Pound because why not? A uh, former Labour MP. Uh, Stephen Pound, what a joy to see you. Hey, Petri, what an honour, honour to see you again, I have it's, to say. It's been I mean, far too missed, long. I missed your, na your name in the honours list, but I'm sure it's an, an oversight. It, it, it must be. Uh, I mean, look, you know, I'm going to hold out for the, for the damehood. Actually, I'd rather yeah. have a knighthood, uh, because it sounds better. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I think Baroness has got a certain ring to it, doesn't it? I like Though, it. Though, to be fair, 
It's got to be Duchess for you. <laughs> oh, you are such a sweet talker. Um, it's, 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 what's extraordinary about this this whole workfare nonsense? I mean, you put your finger on it to a certain extent. Look, if you look at that figure, the two and a half million people, if you look at the uh, long-term people on sickness after, say, from 1945 onwards, the figures was actually going down, which is not surprising. Then suddenly they rock it up in the mid-80s because that was the time when the government decided politically it would be better to have people on sickness benefit than on unemployment benefit because the unemployment figures were you know, hung around the then government's neck. And we're still suffering from that today. In amongst that two and a half billion people, a lot of people, we, quite frankly, any civilized society would not be expecting them to work. A large number of people who are physically incapable of work, or for various reasons, and we should be saying, as a civilized society, you're not skivers and malingerers and you know slackers. You're people that we should be helping to support. And you take that out of them, then there are a small group of people who, quite frankly, could be encouraged to work. The two ways not to do it, firstly, is to create a vast, massive plethora of boot-filling agencies going around, setting themselves up above chip shops in Walthamstow or somewhere, and saying that we're going to educate people and you know, send them out to these gardening clubs and jogging clubs. I mean, the, the Duchess Hoskins tradition of, you know, Justin Urquhart, Stuart and Co. walking to the pub is all very well. You'll probably be making as much money as Baroness Moan at that rate. I mean, <laughs> I mean that's the thing, isn't it? That these things are, are generally, when they're set up, because there is no oversight on them, because there is like, well, we'll pay you uh, half a million pounds or you have two million pounds to get X many people into a, a running club. And I even if you don't manage it, we're still going to pay you. Uh, yeah. that, that, because those companies will say, well, I'm not doing it if there's a limit that I've got to reach. So government will just sign a check. <laughs> and, th and then there's no oversight. So it's, there's no value for money uh, there's in also that. There's also an absolutely fundamental flaw in this whole idea. There's something pr pretty rotten at the basic the idea. Of it. What they're saying is they should make the NHS work for the benefit of people who are on long-term sick to get them back into the marketplace. Well. The NHS should be working for every single man, woman and child of us anyway. It should be a, a service for all of us. But, but I, I'm, I'm sorry, but I do find this very, very depressing. And, and to have the, uh, the idea that it's not going to kick in until 2025 anyway, and they're going to have like 11 trial areas. I'd be interested to know, you know what the constituencies are that they're going to be trialling this in. But look, it, it's, it's something, it's, it's yet again, it's, it's, it's not just jam tomorrow. You know, it, it's a sort of, I think you talked about carrots and sticks. Well, this is, theoretically, it's a, a carrot-shaped stick that they're, they're trying to use it simply doesn't work what we need is to first of all stop this this great blizzard this great kaleidoscope this great plethora of agencies and people who just pop up and you know they meet meet some minister in the pub and they get the next thing they're going to get a contract what we need to do is to get this back into where it should be the department of work and pensions at the moment the two agencies involved here the nhs and the dwp have both undergone massive re-evaluation and restructuring and recalibration and re god knows what in the last couple of years what we need to do is actually bring it back into where it should be, into the health service and into the employment service, instead of all these little spin-offs. Justin Urquhart Stewart, who I frequently refer to as the best chance of the exchequer we never had. Oh, I agree. Yeah. He, he, he actually said a, you know, a very, very valid point about the involvement of local councils and local authorities. Now, sadly, this government has, has an absolute antipathy. They, 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 they react to them like Dracula does to garlic when you mention uh, you know, local councils. They're quite horrified by it. I think the local council should be involved. But if you actually have a look, and, and yet again, uh, Your Grace, you know, the other point that you mentioned about the devils and details, have a look down at Victoria Atkins and Mel Stride's statement. They're talking about stakeholder community engagement groupings on a local basis. Well, I'm sorry. I want to see, I don't have a bunch of people sitting around in the library drinking cold tea and having a whinge. What we want to do is to get some proper, proactive, intelligent work, targeted work at the centre from the NHS to ensure that people who are ill get support. And yet again, the issue of mental health comes up. Because when I, I mean, I was 22 years as an MP, and I dealt with a lot of people who were on long-term benefit. We came into PIP, and we came into all these, all these different schemes. Some of them, quite frankly, I could see were swinging the leg, and I told them so. And they all came back with the obvious answer: How do you know that I haven't got a bad back? Or, mm -hmm. or how do you know? I remember one person saying, "I suffer from chronic agoraphobia." And I said, "Well, you need know, come to my surgery, matey, and that's two miles from where you live." He said, "Well, that's different, isn't it?" And I said, "Well, no, it's not different. You know, <laughs> there are people like that. But look, there are also a lot of. I mean, look at Tony Hudgel, that hero, that boy you know, who, who lost both his legs. You know, who, who's an absolute hero, who got a, a well-deserved award in the, in the honours list. Somebody like that is always going to have profound difficulties getting a job. I'm not saying." there's a lot of people like him 
but there's an awful lot of people who are physically or mentally incapable. And as a civilized, sane society, very wealthy, I think we should be looking after them. And I'm sorry, the idea that two, you know, not, not top-ranked ministers, Mel Stride and Victoria Atkins, have been sent out there as outriders for this scheme, it doesn't satisfy the Tory right, who basically want chain gangs, they want people picking up litter and rubbish and wearing orange jumpsuits and on the side of the motorways, you know, and, they, and it doesn't satisfy the, the more liberal Tory side who actually say we want more support. It does nothing. It's confusing, it's complicated, it's split up and it's too widely spread, and it doesn't come in until 2025 anyway. So heck, why on earth are we beating ourselves up about something when we know that the solution not, is... Yeah, as soon as the, yeah, the election happens, we might be looking at a very different landscape. But look, Labour are going to have to pick up on this issue, aren't they? They are going to have to pick up on the issue that, that there, is, there are so many people uh, not working, uh, those economically yeah. inactive. Um, uh, you know, are they going to have the same attitude yeah no definitely not the, the thing is you've got to realize that the whole world of work is changing beyond all recognition in the next year it's not just because of ai it's not because of the amount of industry that will transfer to renewables and we'll be you know, instead of paying the swedes to build wind farms we'll be doing it ourselves so many things are going to change and there's so many different ways it's education is a key factor in here. We have to educate people to realize that my generation, you left school at 15, you had the same job for 50 years, you retired, you spent 10 years down at Fulham, crying your eyes out, and then you died. You know, I mean, it's, things have changed. People have been doing different jobs. So education, it's a huge difference. Support, absolutely right. But the idea that every single one of those two and a half million people is somehow in dodging work and should be active, the first thing we'll do is to strip that down and say, look, a large number of these people simply can't be working. And we'll work with the doctors. Instead of saying to doctors, you've got to have a limited number of sick notes, we're actually going to say to doctors, what is, are you doing as the medical practitioner? You can't just pass the buck by saying this person is unfit for work. What is the treatment? What is happening for them? What is mm. the process? Pull that together and actually look at it through a, a, a slight bit of humanity, but above all, a bit of sense and a bit of logic here. And instead of taking the easy way out and slowing it off to some bucket shop who can set themselves up overnight as a jogging, running, gardening club, actually do the government's job. The government if should... don't knock my retirement plan. <laughs> I'm seeing a chance to make some money here. Uh, Stephen, listen, it's wonderful to talk to you. I just want to say very quickly um, that you've been working with my, my son for quite some time, but I'm totally unaware of it. Uh, Jake at the other place. He's not your boy, is he? Hmm. You are kidding me. You're I'm way too young. <laughs> but Jake, this is what, heavy metal, Jake? Yeah, right? yeah, Jake, with a beard. Yes, I know, and, you know, and, and, and the... Uh, Ornaments. <laughs> he's a good boy, though, isn't he? <laughs> he he's a smashing lad. He, he always greets me with a huge hug. Yeah. And it's, 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 you know, I had no idea. Well, I have to say, what I can say, Your Grace, is that the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Oh. And he, he's a lovely <laughs> lad. Oh, well, thank you so much. He adores you. Absolutely adores you. Uh, Stephen Pound, thank you very much indeed. Stephen Pound, former uh, Labour MP, very critical of the scheme. Are you critical of the scheme? Are you somebody who is worried about it? Like, like Stephen said, I mean, look, this probably you know, may or may not happen, but are you worried about it? Do you think that they will try and get you to do one of these things and you simply can't do it? Anthony is in Burnham-on-Sea on this. So good afternoon, Anthony. Good afternoon, Petrie. How are you? Yes. I used to be in the, in the uh, private sector mm -hmm. and uh, they were the pro against the public sector. Well, the rules were that you could just pick up the phone as a teacher or a policeman or this, that, and say you didn't want to come in because you felt a bit poorly, and you would get full sickness pay. For us lot, we had to get a doctor's note, wait three days with nothing. So if they broke their leg and I broke my leg. For the first three days, I wouldn't get nothing. Now, why is there two separate systems in this? I'm not talking about a long-term sickness. Like, uh, this, you know, that's the first in Labour MP. Oh, I, I, I did go with it. He's pretty good. But uh, it, uh, you, you, you have to stop the schemes themselves, the basic schemes for all these teachers, doctors, uh, or civil servants especially. Yeah, I had a friend of mine who worked in the dietary department of a, of a large hospital in West London. And she was able to phone up for a duvet day, last minute, yeah, 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 last yeah, minute, yeah. or a family day, or a, um, I feel a bit 
uh, day or I just want the day off shopping day. And and they, they, they were built Wimbledon. into the system. Yeah, they could say, go to Wimbledon and all that sort yeah, of thing. Yeah. I've known the police and I've known teachers say, here, I haven't had my, in my days, the, the legal amount of sickness I get in, in 10 days, I better take it before the end of the financial oh. year. Yeah, see, that, no. that's not right, is it? I mean, I, no. I, don't, I don't get any sick pay or any holiday pay, so I tend to drag myself in here. <laughs> but, 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 yeah, I You're mean, that, I do hear sector. that. Mm, I do hear people say, oh, I've got two weeks sick left, so I'll, I'll, I'll take some time yeah. off. Well, this is where um, Stephen was a bit wrong there when he said two and a half million. I reckon half of those are pulling the wool. You I reckon? really do. Yeah, yeah, probably more than half. The, 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 I mean, he's been very generous, Stephen. There, I, I'll give him that. But, but, uh, and and the other guy you had on, another brilliant guy, Justin. I yeah. think I think there's more than fifty percent of them are pulling the wool over, over the people's eyes. Well, do you so know what? I, 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 it would be interesting to really, really be able to find that out because we all know Skyvers, right? Uh, but I, I also think that there are a lot of people who genuinely have mental health issues, or oh, they, yeah, yeah. you know, and 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 they just can't face it or that you know and and look while there's a benefit system the bar might be quite low you know people might go you know but when you're self-employed you go in unless your legs hanging off by a sinew right yeah but the other... when you're when you've got the opportunity to get sick pay the bar comes down a bit lower so if you've yeah, got a sore throat you might take the day off made it so easy for people didn't they when you walk in the room they say what's wrong with you i got mental health I got a headache. And I well, got yeah, when they made that, uh, they made you can't the... prove the difference, can you? You can't prove them wrong, can no, you? No, you can't. And, and also, they they decided. I can't remember what year it was. It was recently uh, that uh, that there was going to be parity between physical illness and and mental illness. So. Um, yeah, so they decided they had to decide that they were both going to be treated as equal in terms of illness, and they, and they they should be. But while people are going to take the mic. Uh, anyway, look, there's loads of um, uh, texts coming in. Uh, Mark from Norwich has said, can we stick theme parks and cinemas in prisons too? Instead of educating criminals so they're more efficient at committing crimes when they get out, I've got a better idea. Uh, build more prisons and make the minimum sentence for every crime 100 years. This is Talk TV. For the news that matters, for the opinions that matter, for the stories that matter, find me, Vanessa Feltz, every weekday at 4pm, only on Talk, on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. We're here! Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals to using Excel bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about sport today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi Sunak the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. He's on <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this is important after watching a Tom Cruise film. 
Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares uh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Just Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas possible, a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you discussion can't, can with you? can't, can you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. Show on Talk TV and Radio, 7 o'clock Saturday night, James Whale Unleash. I don't need you coming in here following me around with a cat. I'm so sorry about this. Saturdays at 7 on Talk TV. Good afternoon. It is Petri here with you until 4 o'clock. Um, this afternoon. I'm back with you tomorrow as well between one and four. And don't forget, coming up at four is the fabulous Trisha Goddard. So uh, you don't want to go anywhere this afternoon. In fact, the weather's not very nice. Just stay at home. Stay at home, listen to the radio or watch the telly. That's what, that's what I'd be doing if I wasn't doing this. I, I'd, I'd literally be doing that on the sofa. Um, coming up in this hour, I have a story for you which I think will shock you as much as it shocked me. And this is our NHS, that we're all waiting for treatment. I haven't had a brain scan for three years, I'm supposed to have two a year. Um, you know, we're all waiting for this, and yet they're carrying out operations, or they were carrying out operations that are frankly beyond the pale. I mean, literally, I am horrified uh, by what they've been doing. Uh, what they have been doing is now considered illegal. And they should never have been doing it in the first place. I'll tell you what that is after, in about 20 minutes' time, actually, about 10, 15 minutes' time. So we're going to be talking about that because it really is quite the most ridiculous thing. Um, um, and also, coming up, we're going to be talking uh, about British soldiers now on standby. We are the rapid reaction force now for NATO. So we're going to be chatting to Philip Ingram about that too. Uh, first of all... <laughs> First of all, though, uh, we need to talk about Liz Truss's peerage route. And, of course, this <clears throat> there's never a coincidence when these things are, are released, right? So this has deliberately been timed to be released at the same time as the, as the New Year's Honours list because um, <clears throat> they hope that we'll ignore this and just get on with the New Year's Honours list. Well, we've talked about the New Year's Honours list. And now is it time to talk about the New Year's dishonest list? <laughs> dishonest. Ooh, that was a slip, wasn't it? Uh, list. Uh, Britain's shortest living Prime Minister, shortest serving Prime Minister, it's all wishful thinking going on here, uh, Liz Truss has unveiled her resignation honours list, sparking an angry backlash from some critics. Miss Truss, who spent 49 days, let's remind ourselves of that, 49 days in office, um, has, <laughs> her, has put out 11 nominees, which largely consist of political supporters and former aides. Quasi Quartang, her buddy, not on it. Interesting. Um, uh, and also, really, she left in disgrace, didn't she? I mean, th did she resign or was she sacked? I mean, look, it, we know what mess it was at that time. Should she have an honours list? I mean, it is protocol, I guess, but it really is coming under scrutiny and criticism. I wonder if you think that it is just stupid. I mean, I, I just think it's stupid uh, that this has been allowed to happen. Anyway, uh, joining me now is Jesse Jo Jacobs. What a great name. A uh, director of Democracy uh, Network. Jesse Jo. Hi, how are you doing, Petrie? <laughs> I'm good, thank you. I love your name. Um, <laughs> listen, um, 
The shortest serving uh, Prime Minister Liz Truss left in disgrace, um, really, having crashed the economy. Um, uh, she and Kwasi Kwarteng. Um, the, a lettuce lasted longer than she did, and that hasn't brought out a New Year's on or a, a, an honours list, has it? Well, 49 days, um, and as you said, many would say that she created the economic mess that people are still recovering from. You know, people are, are suffering. I've heard stories this Christmas of people again going without heating and eating, and yet we have a list where two donors, one I think it was £20,000 that donated to her leadership race, has now been given a place in the House of Lords. We have to remember we're talking about That's a about good House return on your money, isn't it? Well, I mean, not for the people who are suffering, who are paying their taxes, the ordinary working people of the UK public uh, who don't have a say in who's going into the House of Lords, who can't make their nominations. I'm sure people, I know people in my family would nominate the, the nurses and the public servants who served during COVID. And yet we, we had uh, Boris Johnson's honours list where it was people who broke lockdown rules. We have Conservative Life Peer in there, Michelle Moan, who's in controversy at the moment because of the PPE scandal, a son of a former KGB official. Like, this is yeah. the second house of our democracy. This is supposed to be a place that shapes the nation, that scrutinise the laws, that govern our NHS, that govern our transport. Everything that makes our society tick is supposedly sport under scrutiny by the people who sit in that house and yet we see time and time again these controversial appointments and many in my network many of the organizations i represent are calling time on the house of lords it's it's really getting to the point now where the british public are sick and tired of it they want to see change and and again this liz's trust has list at 49 days that give her a, an ability to appoint these people show once again that this is a failing archaic institution that must be reformed. It, it, it's interesting, isn't it? Because, I mean, what I meant by a good return on your money is that you donate twenty grand, and then you've got a lifetime of uh, of being a uh, in the Lords uh, with all the benefits and financial benefits that comes with that. I might have lent a tw twenty grand or given a twenty grand if I if I <laughs> if I'd known that. Uh, you can retire on on the money they get at the Lords, can't you? And that's the thing, you know, a lot of the ordinary public, your your listeners, your viewers, who's got £20,000 to, to donate to yeah. a political party? We're struggling to donate £20 to a charity that's helping people at this, these difficult times. And so that's why we rightly have to say it is time, we have to call time on the House of Lords. Three quarters of the country actually believe that our political system is performing badly and dis dissatisfaction with the House of Lords comes to top actually alongside the bullying and the behaviour of parliamentarians themselves. So, uh, we, you know, we're going into 2024, we've got, we're going to have a general election. Surely we can start, when we see things like the failing NHS, like failing schools, we can lay all the blame at party politics, but is it time that we also lay blame at politics itself and say that any government, any future government, any political party wanting to govern the UK in 2024 must commit to reforming politics itself. People are losing trust. One of the biggest conversations I'm having with people at the moment who are thinking about voting, they say things like, well, they're all the same. So therefore... I mean, I, to be fair, I say that as well. But Jesse, Joe, it, it's a bit like asking turkeys to, to vote for Christmas, isn't it? I mean, people go into, you know, when they get into any form of power, the Lib Dems are a case in point, right? Uh, they wanted to change the voting system, but they gave it up for some, you know, they gave up things to barter and, but you know, and, and nothing's really changed. So you get a situation where you've got MPs at the moment whose, whose goal is either to present a TV show, it seems, or to, to get into the House of Lords, and, and that is their retirement plan. So they are, those that are in uh, government, and Labour will be the same, uh, any of them will be the same, we think, well, I don't, I don't really want to rock that boat. Let's keep it as it is, because then I can get my cronies in there, and I can, you know, it, it, you know, take take brown envelopes and get people in, and I can, you know, it works. It's a system that works for us. It doesn't. It may not work for the country, but it works for them. I guess we have to. I still fundamentally believe in democracy, and I believe in our voice as the public. And so, I'm not sure the governments do. 
but they will listen if we all join forces and we all make our voice loud and clear that if you want to deliver change, if you want to govern the country, then commit to political reform. Win our trust back, win our hearts back, win our minds back. It's not enough to just say you're going to fix the economy or you're going to fix the NXS. We want you to fix politics. And so a lot of organisations that I represent will be making that call on behalf of the public and they will be asking the public to lend their support to say when you when you go into you know when you are asking for change ask for political change because if we want to fix our nhs if we want to fix public transport we have to fix the decisions the decision making system is our politics itself and so well, we can't throw that we, we you know we've got to be very careful haven't we about throwing the baby out with the bathwater because some of these these lords uh, and dames and ladies they work extremely hard they are proficient they are qualified uh, they are you know lawyers architects doctors surgeons uh, builders you know they they come from uh, across the spectrum and they work very very hard surely the danger with abolishing the lords is is replacing it with something that is less good i mean look at the quality of the mps we've got at the moment if we had to elect a second chamber i mean how much worse is the quality going to be so only 4% of the public think that the House of Lords itself should stay as it is. Like oh, That's only 4% of the public. And there's actually right. less trust in the House of Lords than there is actually in the House of Parliament, in, in, um, in the House of well, Commons. Well, maybe they don't know enough so, about what the Lords does, actually. So what, what I think that the thing is, what you've mentioned some good examples and there are some good hard-working people in there but you also have 92 year old land owning lords who inherited their right to be there that in itself is absolutely wrong and you'll have you probably have got amazing pub landlords who know their communities better than anyone who could make much better decisions in that place than a 92 year old land owning lord but they don't have 20,000 pounds to donate to a political yeah, party I they know, don't I get have your the point. but, but we, we so need a we need we a second chamber, a don't we? We need a second, a second chamber. Cha a second chamber is a, is, a, is a good thing, in my opinion. And many of the organisations I represent would say it is. But what we do say is the current way it works is the broken thing. That's what's losing the public's trust. That's what's enabling Liz Trust to make an appointment of some of the people who donated to her campaign after her having only 49 days as the Prime Minister of this country. So the system itself is broken. So so any political party coming into a general election next year must commit to reforming politics and the House of Lords. We could have a public debate on this. I'd love to see a public debate, maybe on talk mm -hmm. TV, or the, where you actually get leading experts around the table, publicised debate with members of the public asking about its future, scrutinising what happens. We could have a citizen's jury, which is an idea from Sortition Foundation, one of our members, who's saying call up a jury service like they did on climate change, like they did on a system to die in Jersey, call a jury, let them hear recommendations, let them let them hear the experts and make recommendations on its future. And the, and then finally, that all political parties must commit to, to as said mentioned, political reform, but particularly House of Lords reform. If only 4% of the British public think the House of Lords should stay as it is, and I can't imagine what it'll be next year after another round of honours list. I mean, um, do, do, should we have... It, it has to change. It has I mean, to change. There's, a, there's a quote, isn't there? If it's, if it's not broke, don't fix it. Well, if it is broke, you've got to fix it. It's broken. No, I, no, I get that. And I think everybody agrees with that. But I do think there's, there's a fundamental issue with the Lords in, the, in that 4% is that if you went back and asked them... Uh, the 96% the, the what the Lords does, they probably don't have a clear view of some of the incredibly important work that does happen there. All they see is these crony lists and go, well, that's outrageous. Uh, but also it's swelling by the day. Yes. Should there yeah. be a one yeah. in, one out? I mean, the 92-year-old gets kicked out if Liz Truss wants... Um, I mean, that would be I a mean, start, that's a lifetime like, peerage, I know, but... I mean, that, exactly, that would be a start. Let's at least have, start to have this debate. If you make the decision to change it, then you can say, right, what are the changes going to be? What do they need to deliver? Yeah. Do we need more regional representation? Does, you know, do we feel like the North or Cornwall or the South West gets an equal voice in the House of Lords? If we think the decisions are made too centrally, people who are more connected to London, then we could have regional representatives. Mm. If we feel like it doesn't represent the industries or the backgrounds of UK 
public, then we could call for something that is more representative of, of the British public. But number one, commit to reform. Number two, we work out what that reform is. That's how it works. That's how you make changes in the country. You commit to change first. We'll say we fix the NHS. Then you bring in your plan to fix it. We fix oh, well, transport. Yeah. This is the plan. Doesn't always get it. Doesn't always get it fixed, does it? We've been talking about fixing <laughs> the NHS. The <laughs> yeah, but we make the commitment first, and surely we should all be all be asking for that. Change the future of the country, change politics. That's how I believe that we'll get the best possible decisions, the best possible outcomes for the British people. Definitely. The House of Lords is symbolic and thing that needs to be changed. Thank you very much indeed. Jesse Jo Jacobs there, Director of Democracy uh, Network. What do you make of the system at the moment of the Lords? Do you just want it abolished? Do you want it gone? Um, we've been talking as well about prisons and education in prisons. Uh, do we turn them into centres of education <clears throat> so that prisoners are less likely to re-offend? Paul has called me from uh, Leeds. And uh, Paul, good afternoon to you. You were in prison. I was. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, literally 11 years ago today, OK, mm. I, was, uh, I was in prison. So I, have, I can speak on experience, OK? Now, when I was sentenced, okay, so this is how, I know maybe you do, do or don't know how it works, but this is, for me, this is how it works. And my crime was not that serious, so I was not on remand, okay? So you get found guilty, and then you remand, uh, you are bailed and to reappear for your sentencing, right? At the time, I was told that I was going to receive a custodial sentence. So I was, you know, so sort of mentally failing for that and, and the like. And what I decided at that, that, that time was... I was going to come out of prison with something I didn't have when I went in, right? And that was an education of some kind, not the criminal kind, but of some kind, OK? So when I went into jail, that actually did happen. I didn't. I wanted to do a cookery course of some kind, but it ended up being a computer course, which, to be fair, wasn't any good to me when I came out, but I did it anyway. And when I was in there, um, quite a lot of the inmates, I mean, I was in, in uh, the amount, the sort of range of people in a jail is about the same as what you get in a busy pub. You'd have street sweepers to barristers and anyone in between. So that's the range of sort of people that are in there. Some are highly educated, some have no education. And the people that have no ed education cannot read and they cannot write. So for those people, right, uh, they will never break the cycle of coming out of jail, OK, and then going back into jail, committing a crime when they're out and going back in. So for education, I think it's a no-no to not do that. And what I will say, because I know you, uh, as I was uh, listening to you earlier, um, you had somebody on, I can't remember it was now, who was, um, and you were saying that, you know, maybe you've got something against people getting a university education in jail that they didn't pay for, as opposed to somebody on the outside who is paying for it. Mm. But I would give the person, any person at all, go to them and say, right, you've got the option of an education, a university education, which you will pay for, OK? And while you're paying for that, you can have your education, you go to the pub, you can do whatever you want to do. Or you can have it for nothing, but your freedom's gone, right? And all you've got is a, 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 a room, which is the smallest room you'll ever go in, with a person you've never met before and you don't know anything about, OK? Um, and... You have, the education's free, but that's what you're dealing with. You can't go anywhere, you can't do anything. Everyone tells you what to do, your freedom's gone. The time that you spend, you will never get back. Money you can earn, time you can never earn. Once that's yeah, gone, but the, you, you've gone got to forever. see that it is, it, it would feel very unfair for, you know, a, a law abiding kid to leave university with a £50,000 debt around their neck. Absolutely, I can see that, but, okay. The other, the other, the other school of thought is, if you, like I said to you, the guy who, I, I can't remember his name, not that I'll tell you that anyway, but what I'm saying is he is never, he's not going to break that cycle. So what you're doing is you're asking somebody to go in a room, right, in one door and come out of the other door and expect a different person. If nothing happens in that room, the same person is going to emerge. I, I absolutely agree with you. My head is saying, look, there's no question that prisons should be about re re reformation. They should be about uh, education. They should... I mean, how children, uh, how adults have left school if they've been brought up in this country with no education is baffling to me, But because that should never be allowed to happen. But I, I just... I, 
I agree with all of my head. I absolutely agree that we should be doing this. But there will be people who, who think with their heart, who go, that doesn't seem fair. And that's all it's, I'm saying. Yeah, I, I, and I, I, can, I can see the point from both sides. Now, the person who's sort of saying that and, and thinking with the heart, they have not experienced or would very much doubt they've experienced what I've experienced, OK? I would very much doubt that. Um, and if you have experienced it, when you when you're dealing with people who, like, um, would would who cannot write, who cannot read, the, mm. who literally would not read a book, a book can contain information. Obviously, depending on the book you're reading, can contain information that can change your life, can change the way you think, can change the you know how you would go about living your life. Okay, that option is not available to that person because they can't read. There's also the stigma attached to this, okay? So not being able to read, right? If you, very few people who can't read will openly admit that. And well, when you're in jail, there are quite a lot of people who can't read or, or struggle with it and won't mention it because of the stigma attached to it, because it's a very basic thing, you know, most... Yeah, I agree, it would be embarrassing, yeah. five and six-year-olds can read a book, but when you get into somebody who's in the 20s and even into the 30s that can't read, there's, there's a big stigma attached to that. So. You know, they're never going to seek help for it. I mean, my, my my idea would be, right? There's a privilege system in jail. I'm not I'm not aware. I'm not sure if you're aware of that. But when you go in, you're you're allowed a basic, uh, sorry, a um, just a standard level of of in, of, uh, of privilege. And then if you if you you know for good behaviour, you, you go into you get to enhanced, and that means you get some extra visits, some extra privileges, etc. Nothing ridiculous, but it's just standard privileges. And then there is a, a, a basic version, which is kind of a punishment, if you like. So, for instance, if you're not doing too well in prison, you can go on to basic, and then you get, like, one visit a month, and etc. I, I don't know what it is now, but it was when I was in something along the lines of that. And what I would do is I would uh, not allow anybody to, to go on to the enhanced system unless they had some, uh, accepted some kind of education. You do get an aptitude test when you go in jail because they obviously want to know what you know, what you don't know, mm. and there's a simple test. Right, they give a simple test. So they know exactly people... where you are academically. I mean, that makes sense. Yeah. It makes sense. Anything that can, can persuade people that actually learning is a good thing. But there would be people with dyslexia, untreated, undiagnosed, and things like that. I, I, I'm with you, Paul. I'm, I'm with my head. Totally, 100%. Um, I've got to take a quick break, but if you want to join in the conversation, all you've got to do is pick up the phone, 0344 499 1000. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. The amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds, so far result, nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. He's on <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this is important after watching a Tom Cruise film. 
Rishi Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares uh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm going going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Just Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas possible, a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you discussion can't, can with you? you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. Hello, good afternoon. It's Petri here with you. And I'm about to talk about a subject which is difficult. It is a difficult subject. And there'll be a lot of people who go, why are you talking about that? Because it's important that we talk about these things. And earlier on, I mentioned to you about the NHS. The NHS that is supposed to be there for you and me. The NHS that is supposed to be there to do no harm. All of these things. And they have been carrying out an operation on women and girls that is completely unnecessary and is just, literally just for the benefit of men. This is your NHS. These are your surgeons have been carrying out an operation on women and girls to make them appear to be virgins. Just think about that, just for one moment. Why? Why? Why is the NHS doing that? In this country? The NHS was told that the hymenoplasties, which is the medical name of this barbaric procedure, uh, was now illegal. It is carried out in private clinics in this country, as is female genital mutilation, by the way, which is also illegal, in this country, in the hundreds of thousands. Now, the hymenectomy, or the hymenoplasties, they are in small numbers, but the NHS has performed this operation on a 10-year-old girl. It's also performed this operation, this unnecessary, misogynistic operation, on a 14-year-old girl. Now, the, the aim of this is to make them appear to be virgins on their wedding night. Why a 10-year-old is having this done, and why a 14-year-old is having this done, it does not bear thinking about. And as soon as the government said this was to be illegal, there was a rush of people having this surgery done in your name on the NHS and it is now believed that this virgin repair operation honestly I'm so angry about it um, some of them were carried out illegally and there's an organization now that wants to have an inquiry into the NHS I mean, why were they doing this in the first place if you want to have it done privately, I mean, even that, I just think the whole thing is, is sick beyond sickness, it is three grand. But the NHS are supposed to be doing hip replacements and cataract operations and brain scans. I, 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 I literally don't have the word. I'm so upset about it because in this country, like I said, female genital mutilation the mutilating of women for men's pleasure. We're pretty much the centre of Europe for that, still. 137,000 women have undergone FGM in this country. 137,000 women, compared to 600,000 across Europe. Great, we're good at something. 
We're the capital for FGM. Let's just mutilate a few more women. Anyway. Joining me now is Anita Prem, MBE, who is founder and president of the Freedom uh, Charity. Thank you for joining me. Hi. Hi. I, 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 you know, th there'll be some people who say, why are you doing this topic? I don't want to think about things like that. But while women are being, uh, uh, you know, abused legally or illegally in this country, we have to say something. And, and just because it's about sex, people go, oh, no, let's not, let's not talk about that. Uh, are you surprised? I mean, I was shocked that the NHS was carrying out these operations anyway. What, what justification would they have? So as a charity at Freedom, we've been campaigning for a number of years for homeoplasty to be a criminal offence. And we came up against a lot of opposition from the government who were very uncomfortable about making this a criminal offence because what it did, it brought in tourism. People that were oh, sending... Their daughters, honestly, this gets worse. People were sending their daughters to the United Kingdom, mainly from the Middle East, so they would come back home with a certificate to prove that they were a virgin. So they came back with a letter from a Harley Street doctor to say, your daughter's a virgin. So when they were trying to get their daughters married, not only did they say, this is her qualifications, this is a photo of what she looked like, but here is a certificate to prove she's a virgin. So we campaigned for virginity testing to become a criminal offence. At the same time as we were doing that, we were campaigning for hymneoplasty to become a criminal offence because when people, when the doctors discovered that the girl wasn't, didn't have her hymen in place, didn't necessarily mean she wasn't a virgin, but when the hymen wasn't in place, these girls were offered hymneoplasty, where, I'm sorry to be graphic, but a piece of skin, fake piece of skin was put over the girl's vagina so on her wedding night she would bleed complete nonsense because unbelievable we know not all girls are born with a hymen so if you're using sanitary products you might have broken your hymen going horse riding i did karate for years mm. it's fault means you, it might not be intact and what right do men have to demand that girls are virgins or women are virgins on their wedding night so we campaigned for this to become a criminal offence. On the 1st of June, it became a criminal offence in this country, 2022. But I was shocked a few years ago when I discovered that this was being carried out on the NHS. And girls, some girls have come to freedom and have begged us to try and find a way to raise money so they could have this surgery, oh this hymenoplasty surgery. Because they said if their families discovered that they weren't a virgin on their wedding night, they risked being murdered by their family and by the groom's family. There'd be a bounty put on them. Can you imagine that this is actually going on today? And we have campaigned for years for this to become a criminal offence. And when you talk about our NHS, where you have... We know, we all know somebody that's waiting for surgery or waiting for treatment on the NHS. How dare they use surgical time and, and medical doctors and nurses to perform this type of surgery over the years? And if you think about during COVID when there were such large queues, and there, as there are now, why was this ever allowed to happen? And we should be protesting. And actually an inquiry needs to be in place as to why this was ever allowed to happen. And there's some people in the NHS are saying, well, actually, it weren't 19 or it might have been recorded under a different thing and it really wasn't that number. How can an operation be recorded incorrectly? I just personally can't and believe it. And it's a fairly specific operation, right? I mean, th there's no mistaking that for a broken toe or a hip yes, operation. Yes, I, I mean, this is an intimate operation. And, 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 and carried out on a 10 year old girl now that that is a safeguarding issue right there that raises a rad flag a red flag to me a 10 year old girl having her hymen replaced it's hot it's it's child abuse let's be really clear there's no way under the sun this should happen to any woman or girl and if it happens in private or backstreet clinics we can protest and argue and people you know should be held to account but to be held in our nhs hospitals that we all we all know, pay for right I, yeah. i've been paying for these girls to be abused that's how i feel uh, that's and why I, i'm so upset about it 
And I agree with you, but I also believe, and I also wear a different hat as a CEO of a charity called Trigeminal Neuralgia. It's what it's the worst painful condition anyone can have, where your trigeminal nerve on your face is resting on a blood vessel. It's called the suicide disease. My members have been waiting, as there's so many other people, for surgery, for consultations. They're not getting in to have this done because people are having this type of surgery, unnecessary, barbaric surgery. And you're right, you know, everyone should be upset and protesting why this was ever, ever allowed to happen. Is this political correctness gone mad? Families, men in the family demanding that their daughters have this. Why has this ever happened? And what can we do to stop it happening in the future? I mean, you know, it, 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 it beggars belief. I mean, the fact that, that, that this uh, that the ruling won't stop the private clinics from doing that, we know that. I'm absolutely mortified, ashamed and horrified that Britain, London, is the European centre for, for, for mutilating women. The, 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 the taxi drivers that pick them up from the airport and take them to the clinics, uh, the, the girls who are going there to be, to, to, to be mutilated beyond repair, beyond anything in this country, in Harley Street or wherever it is, and then being sent... I mean, I, 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 I've never understood how we've not been able to put a stop to that. And we won't be able to put a stop to this. Well, we have been able to put a stop to it, but we've been very reluctant to change the law. And it's only been a year. Can you believe that? This has only been a criminal... I can't, friend. I can't believe that. It's horrifying. I mean, you know, as a charity, we campaigned against forced marriage. And this is linked to that. This is all interlinked. So when a girl is being shown to various men, her photograph is being shown for her to get married. These are UK citizens, I have to tell you, that are being forced into marriage. A photograph, her education, can she cook, what does she look like, and a certificate to say she's it's a virgin. It's a cattle market, isn't it? It's just animals. They're just treated like animals. Well, it's, it's abuse, and in children, it's child abuse. And but surely that should have been a red flag. That's what, that's what I cannot understand, uh, 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 Anita, is that if a 14-year-old if a girl or a 10-year-old girl is presenting to, a, to an NHS GP and the parents are there saying we want her to, to have her hymen repaired so we can... At what point did the GP say, no, hang on, what's going on here? What are you doing with that 10-year-old? What are you doing with that 14-year-old? Why is this an, a situation? Why is this an issue? What are you planning? It seems that they just get referred straight to surgery. Why hasn't social services been involved? Absolutely. Why isn't there a case conference where the police are involved and everyone is protecting the most vulnerable girls in our society from these barbaric crimes that have been allowed to happen? It's bad enough that they've happened. And the fact is, nobody spoke about it for years and years. And we've just started to talk about it on the law change. But, you know, when we found out it was happening in the NHS, I really, really couldn't believe it. I was told it was happening in backstreet surgeries. I was told it was happening in top clinics in London. But I was really surprised a number of years ago when I discovered it was happening on the NHS. And there's no medical justification for None. it. None. Unbelievable. I, I, I'm, I'm absolutely stunned and I'm so glad we could bring a voice to this. I'm getting uh, lots of comments from people going, oh my God, I never knew. This is absolutely disgusting. And that's what something like this needs and female genital mutilation. We need to shine a light on this and, and say to people, this is, this is abuse, this is violence towards women and this is completely and utterly unacceptable in this country in 2023-24. Uh, in We've got to put a stop to this treatment of women and girls. Stop it. I mean, you can see I'm wearing a red badge. And this is a national symbol against FGM that Freedom came up with. Where, we do, go I, where do I get one? I'll, go, I'll wear I'll one. Send you one. I'll send you one. We go into schools and we've seen 70,000 children, boys and girls, and we've educated them against FGM and forced marriage and virginity testing. And one of the things we do is talk to young men because this is happening in their name. In and their name, yeah. Stand up if you don't want this happening in your name. And we went to a school and one of the teachers said, well, we really don't do this as mixed education, do the boys separately and girls separately. I said, absolutely not. We're going to have them all together. So she said, oh, she was a bit nervous. She said, okay, boy, girl, boy, girl. 
and they sat there and I told a story about a girl that had been mutilated for a gym, age appropriate because obviously they're children. And then I said to the boys, if you don't want this to happen, stand up and say, not in my name. And every single boy in the school, so we're looking at, you know, maybe 500 boys, they didn't say it, they roared it at the top of their voice. Girls were in tears knowing that they were going to be protected by these boys. And, you know, we have to, we can change this in a generation. Why are we allowing children, girls to be mutilated in this country? Why are we allowing it to happen in our names? We can't be politically correct about this. This is child abuse and we have to stand up. It doesn't matter who the culture is or where they have I come. I agree. And that's the issue, isn't it? It's the culture. I think people are too scared to say it's a particular culture and, and everybody, you know, like, oh, this is what the Muslims prefer and this is what... Uh, and it just... It, it is... We've got to stop it. We've got to stop because this has got to stop. Um, I'm glad to talk to you, Anita, and I hope I get to do it again. You're welcome on my programme anytime. Um, so Anita Prem, uh, MBE, they founder and president of the Freedom Charity. Well, you heard it here. What do you make of that? I don't even know what to... I could cry, honestly. I could cry. I'm going to take a quick break. Be back in a moment. We're here! Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals to using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about sport today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Bravman. She's heading up one side and Rishi Sunak the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. He's on <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this is important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares uh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm going going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Just Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can't, can you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. Hi, good afternoon. Wasn't that a stunningly shocking uh, interview? there um and i just want to say we did have the phone number up on the screen there for any uh, women or girls or boys uh, concerned for their sisters or or, or or relatives um there is an nspcc fgm helpline 
It's a 24-hour free helpline for anyone worried about FGM. And I would put uh, sort of, uh, you know, the virginity certificates and all that stuff as well. Uh, 0800 028 uh, 3550. So that's an NSPCC FGM helpline. I mean, that's for anybody. It's not just for kids. If you're somebody who's concerned that a child may be at risk with this, um, please do get in touch with them. 0800 028 3550. And if you're afraid that there is an imminent danger of a girl being abused in this way, you must call the police. It's illegal, it's abuse and it's violent abuse. So if you think they're being put in a cab and taken off to have some surgery, you call the police. Um, just to be clear, not all Islamic groups practice FGM and many non-Islamic groups do, including some Christians. I don't care who you are, it's barbaric, it's disgusting. Uh, some Christians, Ethiopian Jews, and followers of certain traditional African religions, and that's from the United Nations. That's directly from the United Nations. Um, absolutely extraordinary. Um, again, it's it's the whole idea that we've been paying for that, the hymen uh, plasty. We that part of the NHS. Oh, disgusting. Maureen is in East Sussex. Maureen, good afternoon to you. Hi, Petri. Hi, you all right? No, I'm in tears. That was the most shocking thing I've ever heard. Oh, my God. I will stand up and fight for every one of these children, for goodness sake. What a thank you so much for making me aware of it. Um, I thought it was important. I didn't know it was happening. Mm. Absolutely, I didn't know it was happening. Not in my name, and I will... I'll go up to London, and I'm not a protester, but this is the most outrageous thing I've ever heard. I'm 71 years old. I've lived in this country all my life, and this is something I would never have dreamed of. Anyway, I'm sorry. No, no, do you never need to be sorry. I, I mean, the fact as well that up until a year ago, the hymen operation was being carried out on the NHS. I have never been a fan of the NHS. Well, I was when I was a kid, but since I grew up and knew a bit more about it, I've been a private client all my life until I retired, sadly, and I bounced back to the NHS. But, no, it needs... And it just, just needs to be tore down and built up again, as far as I'm concerned. I cannot but, believe that they've been but, carrying out unnecessary, completely pointless operations on girls, a girl that it's, was 10 years old and one that was 14, it, and there was no highlight to social services? What? Abs what? what? Gone wrong? It's sick, it's depraved, and it's awful, and it is does not belong in this country doesn't belong in any country, but we start here, right? No, indeed. <laughs> yeah, we start here. Well, we're, it's we're totally misogynistic. I mean, um, uh, 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 unlike you, Maureen, I mean, it genuinely upset me when I when I read about it. Absolutely. And, and I, I really ummed and erred about doing it because it's talking about the hymen and it's not sexy. And people oh, go, ooh, oh, ooh, don't do it's that. It's a woman thing. Yeah. But I just think that it's actually, it's abuse and it needs to it be is. called out. And it, it's child abuse for the young ones and it's mental abuse for the older ones. Mm. It's, it's just abuse. Just Men need to sort their heads out. They really do. I know. I don't, I, I, I don't, I don't get it. I really don't get it. And, and as, as, um, um, uh, as she was saying, that it, it, it's a situation, isn't it, where it's not always the case anyway. So you're faking something. You're actually, you know, creating something that may not be, uh, not be real anyway. Uh, Anita, uh, Anita Prem, uh, was saying. I mean, it's extraordinary. It is. It is. And, and I, I, I was so pleased to hear that she said those young boys stood up um, oh thank god the generations I, I have a lot of faith yeah 
in the generations yeah. behind us. But, Absolutely. Uh, and the men, the young men that are coming through as well who wouldn't dream of torturing a woman in this way. They wouldn't even, no. they wouldn't dream of it. Let's have hope, yeah. Maureen. Let's have hope. I do. I do <laughs> have hope. And bless you for calling. I... Uh, thank you. OK. And I hope you feel better. Um, it is, it's, it's difficult, right? I mean, what a... I can't. Honestly, when I read it, I was just in so much shock uh, that the NHS were carrying out these things, or had been carrying out these operations. Um, right, let's uh, return to a topic we spoke about earlier, um, and that is prisons becoming more of education places. So places where people who break the law can go in and learn something so they don't break the law again. Is that enough of a punishment for you? Or do you think, actually, we, what we want to do is stop having more victims? Um, Ian has called about this from the Isle of Wight. Hi, Ian. Hello, Patrick. Um, can I first of all echo what the previous caller said and uh, Anita before her? Absolutely disgusting. Not in my name either. Um, I don't know how we've ended up here. I don't know how the NHS even got to the place where it was doing that, but there you go. No, no, it's, it's mind boggling. Mm. Mm. Okay, talk, talk to me about prisons. Yeah, education and prison. I'm, I'm a retired teacher. I spent a long time working in special education. So I've got to be honest with you. I was working with young kids and, and teachers amongst them say, we know where he's going to end up. Um, they were denied help with dyscalculia, dys um, um, and, uh, and dyslexia, and, yeah, yeah. Dyslexia, dysgraphia, yeah. Un unable to get help, and I would talk with parents years down the line and explain to them that they're going to have trouble getting their GCSEs. And the parents would say to me, yeah, but this has started when he was four, and he wasn't given, or she wasn't given the help that they needed, and they've ended up where they are now. And a lot of these kids, I don't work in the pupil referral unit. Um, a lot of the kids there had special educational needs, inability to read, write, count, all of these things. And they were destined, destined for a life of petty crime. We knew it was going to happen. And that's why they were in people with all units, unable to cope with mainstream education. And what will happen is they won't be able to keep down uh, what they're to get a job in the first place, won't be able to keep a job because of the basic skills that they love. And what we see is government that refuses to acknowledge the fact that we need to make plans for things 10, 20 years ahead of us so that we can help kids who are struggling at school to avoid that life of crime that is sitting there waiting for them so that when they do enter, they actually get their education from the criminal types so just encourage them back into it. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, the thing is, I, I genuinely believe there's no such thing as a thick or stupid child. I think there is a badly educated child. Um, because you can teach... Children want to learn. You can teach them things, even if they're not going to be academic. It doesn't make them stupid, right? If their brains are in their hands, if their brains are in their feet... I couldn't agree with you more. I, you know, if you want me on my high horse, I'll get on. But I tell you what, you can't teach some kids differential calculus. No. But what you can do is you can teach them how to put lay bricks, how to be electricians, how to dig holes in the road. If you're um, an MP coming back from your third skiing holiday of the year and you come home and there's water pouring through your ceiling, your best friend is a plumber okay. and an electrician. Yeah. And if we don't start teaching kids, those kids that can't do differential calculus and algebra, if we don't start teaching them, giving them easy access apprenticeships so that they can... At the age school. of 14. I, that, that, 14. You know then if you're going to be academic or you're not. And, and, and it yes. doesn't matter. Let's, let's have respect for people who are the plumbers and the electricians who are a lot richer and a lot smarter than you and I are because they went into that profession yes. instead of teaching and broadcasting. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, we're talking exactly on the same we line. are we are exactly absolutely joined at the hip on this honestly i completely agree with you i've said it for years uh, i really have said it for years uh, great
great to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed, Ian, a special educational needs uh, teacher there. Um, Nicholas has called in now from Bath. Hi, Nicholas. Hello, Petrie. I am absolutely outraged and disgusted that this has been done in my name on the NHS. Um, I don't know where to get one of these badges from. I would pay £20 for one, you know, uh, just to have one of those badges to stop... Yeah, I, I agree with you. They cost two... Barbaric. Listen, they cost £2 each. It's a red triangle badge. It's available from... Where would I get one from? Freedomcharity.org.uk. I'm getting one. Yeah, I'm going to get one. Uh, Freedomcharity.org.uk. And they cost £2 pounds each. Uh, I need a pen. <laughs> oh, we'll put it up on the screen. We'll put it up on the screen so you'll be able to take a yeah, photograph of it. Do. Please do. I, I, I just can't believe it. We're, we're going back 500 years. Unbelievable. Yeah, but it was shocking, isn't it? And, and I bet when I first started talking about it, you were like, oh, I don't want to hear about this. But then when you no, do... No, no, I've always been against it. I mean, what they do in their own country... You know, it's it's their way of life. We can't uh, change that, do, right? But 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 not here. We're we're a twenty first century uh, country, and people that come here, you know, there's a, a lot of old sayings like "When in Rome, do as the Romans do." Uh, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, uh, and a few other things. You know, um, that have uh, been but mutilating all, girls all, in this way. Things. Yeah, with Sorry? FGM. Uh, I mean, uh, putting girls into 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 hospital to have this operation into an nhs well, i mean that's what i can't believe i, I was like i was like uh, uh, anita I, I thought well this is probably going on in the back streets this is going on in private clinics oh no nhs disgraceful uh, unbelievable can you put on the screen for me then and i'll uh, I'll, I'll it's up on the screen uh, now um, and okay. if, you, if you just take a photograph of it, then you don't have to write it down. It's modern. <laughs> We're modern uh, now. It's come up. Okay, brilliant. <laughs> Nicholas, thank you. thank you. And thank you for calling and thank you for your support as well. Because women need men like you. We need all the men to support <laughs> women and girls. Uh, I love women. They'll get all the support they need from me, if I can give it, that is. <laughs> really, just showing that badge, just wearing that badge will mean the world uh, to, 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 to all of us, really. Because women, we can't do this on our own. We can't fight for the freedoms of women on our own because we need men to back us up. We need those boys in schools to be standing up and saying, not in my name. I don't want my wife to have, uh, you know, to, to have FGM. I don't want my wife to have to go through surgery. I don't want, you know, I don't want that. I, I'm not interested in that. That's what we need. We need all of us. It needs to be a concerted effort uh, for all of us. But the boys have to be with us. The men have to be with us. Otherwise, we can't do it. We can't change everything by ourselves. Um, there's a, a message here just saying from Stephen in York. Hi, Petra. The more I think about FGM, the more I see a comparison with the circumcision of male babies. It's not the same. If you've ever seen the image of what happens to a woman, with FGM, but he goes on to say it's also barbaric, uh, yet nobody dare criticise the practice. Right, uh, that's it for this hour, but stay where you are because there is so much more to come. This is Talk TV. Want to get to grips with the stories that really matter? To cut through the spin and the BS. Want unvarnished and fiery debate? Then join us for Cross Talk. One o'clock every weekday. We're here! Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi Sunak the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. 
for the amount of time it's taken. The number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds, so far result, nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you should have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. He's on <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares uh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interviews. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Are you prepared to call is Hamas possible, a terror group? Is it possible to have a rational discussion You can't, discussion can you? With you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. I'm getting ready for my new primetime show on Talk TV and radio. 7 o'clock Saturday night, James Whale Unleash. I don't need you coming in here, following me around with a car. I'm so sorry about this. Saturdays at 7 on Talk TV. Good afternoon, it is Petri here with you for another hour, or well, just under an hour, but I'm here until four o'clock when the fabulous Trisha Goddard will be taking over the airways. Um, so you'll want to stick around for that. So like I said, just put your slippers on, lie on the sofa, let it all wash over you. Um, uh, we're continuing with the conversations that we've been having through the last couple of hours, so if you've heard anything you'd like to join in with, then uh, please do. I'm, I'm extremely proud of you all for the reaction that I've got from the, uh, the, the conversation I had with uh, Anita Prem, MBE, about the mutilation of women and girls in this country in the name of men. Uh, and uh, that is obviously FGM and the hymenoplasties that were carried out, were carried out on the NHS. Yep. Um, I still can't get my head around that. But anyway, so we're st I'm still taking calls on that, but I've been very proud of you all. Thank you uh, for the support that you've shown for this uh, and uh, wanting to get involved as well, because we do need everybody to get involved. And like I said, men as well, boys as well. It's very important that you educate your boys, even if they're not part of those religious groups. You educate your boys that there are, might be girls in their classrooms that are at risk, right? So, uh, and they should tell you or highlight it to the teachers if they think any of their mates uh, might be heading towards the surgeon's knife. Um, so, uh, I just want to say that because I definitely educated my boy about it. Um, but anyway, so we're still taking calls on that, um, and I'd love to hear from you. 0344 499 1000. We're also still talking about education in prisons. It's a no brainer, isn't it? Surely that's what we should be doing. Uh, but in this hour, we're going to be talking... What a mixture we've got this hour. We're going to be talking hedgehogs. Uh, and we're going to be talking uh, entertainment with Josh Rom. Well, the less entertaining part of entertainment, really. And that is how just how many celebrities we lost this year. So we'll be looking at those numbers as well. But first... Um, something else you may not be aware that's going on, and I don't know why that other people aren't talking about this, but... Um, Thousands of British soldiers are being placed on standby, ready to deploy within days. And this is because the UK forces have taken over the lead on NATO's rapid response force from the start of the new 
year. So anything that goes down that NATO needs to respond to, the British armed forces are the first ones that will be in the firing line. They will be the first ones to respond, this rapid reaction force. Um, and to talk uh, about this with me, I'm delighted to say we've got Philip Ingram, MBE, who's a former senior military intelligence officer. Philip. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Petri. Lovely to see you. Um, this is uh, quite. This is a big step for us. Are we ready for it? It is, but it's a routine step. You know, this has been um, you're part of NATO's um, uh, reconstruct after Vladimir Putin's first illegal invasion of Ukraine in 2014, um, and you rotate NATO's very high readiness joint task force, which is what the UK is taking ownership of for the next year um, around different NATO members. The Germans have been doing it beforehand. Um, and this means that the UK will have the leading role in it. It brings in forces from other countries as well, but they're just put on that high readiness. They stay in their home country, ready to go at short notice, keeping their kit ready to go, uh, keeping their ammunition stocks um, available um, and training together where they can. Oh, when you talk about a kit, what are we talking about? Because war has a very different tone to it sometimes. Are we talking about a land war? Are we talking about a kit as such as aircraft? Are we talking about the Navy? What are we talking about in terms of kit? Uh, this joint task force is primarily land-based. Um, of course, there's um, air elements and maritime elements uh, held at similar readiness, uh, and they're there. It's much easier to move an aircraft uh, from a runway to somewhere in the world very quickly indeed. It's much more difficult to move um, a series of tanks. So this um, ca uh, capability is based on the UK's 7th Light Mechanised Brigade Combat Team. Um, it used to be 7 Armoured Brigade in the old days that yeah, you and I, I remember. probably remember, uh, the Desert Rats. Yep. Um, and, and it's got you know, armoured capability, it's got artillery capability, it's got um, infantry capability, your know, light mechanised infantry, engineering, logistics, a medical regiment. Um, and it's based on the Royal Scots Dragoon Guards, 4th Battalion, the Royal uh, Regiment of Scotland and 2nd Battalion, they're all Angli um, Anglian Regiment um, and uh, a number of others that are coming from uh, different countries providing you know, elements of the armoured capability, the armoured infantry capability. So it's a sort of a golf bag of uh, land-based stuff that can be Great brought together and though. focused where it's needed. Fantastic fabulous regiments. regiments. Fabulous regiments. So, uh, so when we talk about the movement of, of, of them, if something were to happen, let's say, uh, let's look at the most obvious uh, uh, place, and that is the borders of, uh, of Ukraine or Russia, um, uh, when we say light infantry, are we talking then about vehicles? I, I mean, I can only remember them as scimitars. They're probably something very different now. Um, <laughs> or, or are they going to be the they're, challenge? They're long gone. Yeah, I thought so. Oh, God, it makes me feel old. But you know what I mean, those smaller, uh, yeah. uh, more agile uh, armoured vehicles. Or are we talking the replacement to what must have happened now to the Challenger, uh, those larger uh, uh, tanks? Well, I, I don't. I, I don't think the British. Uh, I haven't looked into the the complete construct of what's happening this year uh, in detail. But I don't think the British are providing the tanks. I think. Okay. Um, I think the Spanish are doing that. The British are providing, um, you know, a, a, an armoured reconnaissance regiment. But it's it, it uses wheeled vehicles with very little armour around them. So yeah. you know, the the, mil the military is changing a lot at the moment. Um, in the way it's configured. Um, the the key with this is it provides a rapidly movable capability to get in and start to um, a send a message first and foremost and b then secure an area for follow-on forces to come through so nato's got a lot more forces um, that are at a high readiness and they're creating from a nato response force um, that they have at the moment they're changing that into a new allied reaction force uh, about mid 2024 now going back a few years that your NATO used to have rapid reaction forces. It I used remember, to have yeah. uh, ace mobile force land, which you remember that looked after the flanks of NATO to the north and south, and the, the Royal Marine Commandos were uh, an integral part of that. And then you had the Allied Rapid Reaction Corps, um, which was based in Germany that the British led and had a number of armoured divisions as part of it. Um, and as things the threat changed. Um, there's more rapid reaction corps, and those still exist, and they'll form the framework of. Um, whatever follow-on capability it is. The key here is getting something that can move very, very fast, that's ready to go if uh, something happens, um, and, and send that clear, clear military message. 
I remember doing a lot of reports on ARC, um, the Allied Rapid Reaction Corps in Germany, where I was based for a while as well. Um, I think we were both there at the same time. I think we were. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, interesting times, actually, it has to be said. Um, are we prepared, though? I mean, we hear a lot uh, about the, the lack of money that is going mm. into the, the uh, uh, armed forces. We hear about the lack of men and women who are joining, retention, recruitment. Are we fit for this? We, we are. Um, you know, we've got a professional military um, and a professional military capability and a, and, a, and a military that's used to making things work even if they haven't got all the stuff that they need to do it. Um, you know, the, uh, I remember uh, preparing to go into Kosovo or, uh, sorry, preparing to go into Bosnia with the ARC um, and the German general that was coming in with this uh, was looking at the British approach and he said, I now know why the British are so good at war. You prepare um, in a chaotic situation all of the time and never have what you need to do it, but you make it work in the end. Uh, and this is where, you know, this is, this is what's happening. And I think the lessons out of Ukraine are showing that e even the theorists had got their theories wrong and were having to reset the amount of ammunition that we have in in stockpiles, the types of equipment that we need, the use of drones and other modern equipment, the balance of what's needed on, on a modern battlefield. And that's being reset and takes a while to reset. But the British are known for their adaptability and their ingenuity. Um, and that's why, yes, we are ready. Fabulous engineers. Uh, they can build anything, can't they? Uh, extraordinary. Um, let's, uh, let's be clear, though, Philip. These, these are not going... Uh, if they are called, they would not be going as peacekeepers. They would not be going wearing a blue beret. Uh, they was, these are fighting forces. This, this would be a, if they were called, this would be a fighting situation? Well, well not necessarily. You know, they're, they're, they're called to respond to you know, anything where there's, there needs to be a rapid presence. So you know, uh, last, la or this year, um, there, there was a call to get troops into Kosovo quickly because there was a danger of Kosovo destabilizing. That came from um, this this type of organisation, um, and again, it was you know, ger German led, but it was it was a, a British capability that would, that went in and um, led um, you know, NATO's rapid reinforcement into its troops inside Kosovo to send that clear message to Serbia: don't destabilize this anymore. And the troops are still there. Um, it seems to have worked, um, and you know, it's all about being able to get that. Um, that that presence on the ground, that sending the message. Remember, I thought that's the what the UN was for. I mean, it's well, hard to the, imagine the what UN the UN is for anymore. Yeah, but the UN doesn't have any troops. The UN has no. got nothing until nations give it, give them to it. So this is, um, and and you know, these troops could go in under uh, under uh, a UN berry if the UK decided and NATO decided to give them to the UN to do that. Mm. But that's a separate process, and politically, it takes an awful lot longer. NATO can react um, across. You know, the, uh, the vast area that NATO is responsible for in all NATO members, uh, NATO can react politically much, much more quickly than the United Nations can. You, you, you uh, try getting the Security Council of the United Nations to agree on anything at the minute, <laughs> at the minute when we've got Russia and China mm. with a veto in it, it'll never happen. It, under what circumstances can you see um, this rapid reaction force being deployed? I mean, there's a lot of a lot of the world is unsettled at the moment. Uh, we, 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 we've no idea of what Iran's doing. North Korea, uh, they're getting militarily ready for something. Um, you, you know, you've got Taiwan uh, and China. It, 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 it's, uh, you know, not to mention uh, Israel, Gaza. You've got, you know, you know, all of these places in Ukraine and, and Russia. Under what circumstances could you see us being deployed? There's a number of different scenarios. Uh, we'll have to remember this is a NATO force, so it's going to meet uh, NATO's priorities, NATO threats, um, or threats against NATO countries. Now, NATO's expanded, so you know, the Russians have threatened um, uh, uh, Finland with um, uh, action, and yeah. if, the, if the Russians decide to maneuver a, a big land capability up towards um, th to threaten the Finnish border, then this force could be deployed very rapidly um, up to reinforce what Finland's got and, and show uh, uh, you know, a NATO solidarity. Again, um, you know, Turkey is a, a NATO member, so you know, on, on the southern flank, if uh, there was a big um, uh, flare-up um, on uh, Turkey's southern flank and the, and the potential threat of you know, the Iranians attacking in through 
um, uh, you know, the, 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 the Turkish borders with forces through Syria and, and through elsewhere, then it could be sent down there as a, as a demonstration. Um, it, you know, it, it, the, the advantage of this capability is its flexibility to be sent to anywhere where it needs to be. And it's a, you know, a relatively light capability, first of all, but with some heavy punch that can be brought in. Uh, and then that gives time for the bigger stuff to get itself ready and trundle out at a slightly slower rate. And, and just looking at, our, you know, we, we both uh, our old stomping ground of, of Bosnia, uh, tragically. It, it feels like that is not certainly not resolved. Uh, as you were mentioning there with Kosovo, uh, Serbia determined uh, to kick things up again. It would seem there are other factions that uh, are, are not happy with the way that, that that land was divided up, if you like, after that. Um, how, how tricky is that situation there? I mean, I tried to keep an eye on it, uh, but it goes very quiet and then it, it, it sort of flares back up again. It, it's extremely tricky um, because it's, it's based on history. Um, you know, and it's going to take a long time before the historical aspects of it get forgotten uh, and it's not helped then whenever you get yeah. oh, more, more than generations and it's not helped whenever you get then the outside influences of Vladimir Putin um, with his long handled screwdriver mm. into Serbia uh, trying to stir you know, what is an unpopular government uh, under Vucic in, uh, Belgra in, in Belgrade anyway um, trying to stir him up to um, be more radical and and you know, to try and destabilize not just Kosovo but as you mentioned Bosnia and other parts of the Balkans because that you know, Putin wants the West to take his eyes off what is happening inside Ukraine and to split um, the West's focus in different areas you know, it wouldn't surprise me if there's a long-handled Putin screwdriver into what's going on um, between Israel and Hamas um, through Iran and, and elsewhere so and we're going to see much more of this in 2024 I think horrible we should. I mean, just the thought of seeing much more of this is just, uh, just. When are we going to learn, Philip? You, you and I have been talking about this stuff for far too long. It'd be nice to just, uh, you know, yeah. talk about flowers and kittens, wouldn't it? It, it? it it would be. And you know, let let let's get flowers and kittens. And, and the one thing I can say is, you know, everyone in the military would far rather be talking about flowers and kittens than weapons and deployment because most military are pacifists. The difference is that they will fight for peace, not demonstrate for peace. Well said been an absolute pleasure. Let's talk again soon. Thank you very much you. indeed. Uh, Philip Ingram, MBE, former senior military intelligence officer. Fantastic stuff. Um, right, we've got uh, so many texts and things coming through. I do want to talk. I do want to read some of uh, these out, but I also do want to take your calls. Um, here we go. Kate in Barnsley has said, oh, absolute admiration, Petri, for you dealing on air with such an emotional and heartbreaking a subject. I think the more it can stun us, the more it needs speaking about. Like you can't get, I, you can't get my head around it either. And that's about the hymenoplasties that have been happening uh, on the NHS up until a year ago. Um, thank you for that. Yeah, we're definitely. I'm definitely going to. If you don't normally, if you're going, oh, who is this Hoskin creature? I normally do a late night program on Monday, Tuesday and Wednesdays. So uh, my producer and I have already spoken and we're going to pick this subject up again. We're going to be talking about this again at some point in the future. So I'll tweet and let you know when that will be. But we will definitely be returning to the abuse of women and girls in this country in the name of uh, men's fun, basically. Uh, so we'll be talking about that. Um, thank you for that, Kate. From Stephen in York. Hi, Petri. The more I think about FGM... Oh, no, I've read that one. Sorry. Well done, Petri, for bringing this up. It's absolutely disgusting and abhorrent that this has been allowed and done on the NHS. Where are the feminists calling this out? This is an another grooming gang scenario. Keep it on the agenda, please. And that's from Anne in uh, Oakley. And, yeah, I, I remember saying very much the same thing when those uh, plastic feminists were protesting about page three um, and saying, well, hang on a minute, there are... There are real, and then going, oh, we've won. Actually, it was my friend Stig Abel that decided that it was a bit outdated. It had nothing to do with you. Uh, try and do something proper if you're going to call yourself a feminist. That's what I think. Right, I'm going to take a quick break, but I will be back in just a moment. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones.
I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you should have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares oh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm going going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Just Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas a terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, can you? Use? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. Hi, good afternoon. It is Petri here with you for the next 15, 20 minutes or so. Um, and then the wonderful Trisha Goddard will be here. I always love seeing her little face. Uh, so she'll be here at the top of the hour to tell us what's going on on her programme uh, this afternoon or this evening. Um, but now let me introduce you to, well, you already know him, it's Josh Rom, uh, entertainment <laughs> journalist. You already know him. Well, I mean, He's on my programme all what the an time. What an introduction. You're like, oh, well, here he is again, he Josh Rom. Just here I he is. I love him, <laughs> and I know you do too, uh, which is why he's back here. Uh, normally he's on my evening show, so, it, you know. There you go. Well, what a treat to see you in the daytime. I know. It's well, it's such dark, a treat. though, now, isn't it, already? Well, well, it, it, mostly. But, mm. at, but actually, the thing is, I know because my birthday was on the 22nd, which is the day after the winter solstice, which oh, is the lot, which is the, sh no, the shortest day of the year. The shortest day of the year. The summer solstice is the longest day. But I always know that my birthday marks the, the, the start ever so slightly of the days will start getting a bit longer now, now that we go into January through to February going edging towards springtime. Yeah, we just Spring get, is on the horizon. We just want to we just want to skip through January uh, quickly because it's horrible month. I know, I know, um, horrible month. Horrible. Now, um, talking of horrible, and we have to look at this because this has been an extraordinary year. Extraordinary. Um, about how many people that we've celebrities and famous people that we've lost. I know. In the last year, and, and it must be because so many of them are reaching that age, but some of them also have been very young. No, exactly. I mean, the f the first one as, as soon as soon as I, I, I I've been kind of thinking about this I, I thought you know straight away Sinead O'Connor dying age 53 Matthew Perry age 54 Paul O'Grady age 67 you know these are middle-aged stars these aren't stars that are going into their 80s I mean yes Tina Turner was that little I bit of a I shock I can't believe that Tina Turner but, I mean I, I, 
but saying that tina turner i mean she died 83 following years of illness so that i mean it, it wasn't the, the, it was a shock when she died it was one of those stars where you you took a sharp intake of breath she mm. was such a legendary artist and but again so fit i mean those legs to I, I mean, just brilliant. just the Gorgeous. powerhouse performances. That that voice was incredible. Those legs were incredible. Oh, the way in which she moved was was incredible. I mean, that's the thing. Tina was just such a legend, such a powerhouse. She seemed to have such energy right up yeah, until yeah. Um, the day in which she died. It seemed like, and, and and that's the thing. There were just so many stars this year where it it was. It was almost like a complete shock. I mean. Paul O'Grady, I think, that was a real... We lost a real national treasure there, didn't we? Oh, we did, yeah. Uh, and and he he was... Uh, he People loved him because of the programmes like The Love of Dogs and things like that. But, uh, of course, I remember him as Lily Savage. Oh, of course, well, who doesn't remember him as Lily Savage? I mean, the there's character... A gen- there's a whole generation, Josh, I, that have never heard of Lily Savage. I mean, I, I find it... Sh- I mean, even as a 90s baby, I find that shocking because, I mean, yes, I know he dropped the character in the, in the 2000s and that's when he started coming in to his own as Paul O'Grady when he hosted the Paul O'Grady show and then he he brought he hosted Blind Date and Blank- Blankety Blank and all of those shows but the Lily Savage character I mean I remember the big breakfast uh you know Lily Live I mean even in Blankety Blank he still hosted that as Lily Savage so Brilliant I mean that's, that's I mean it was just I mean and actually, one 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 has all of these conversations around drag queens now and drag queen story times. But one also has to remember when it comes to those debates that people like me have grown up watching the likes of Lily Savage oh, making Lily Savage make, open the door. I, there's no doubt. No, but also uh, pantomime danes yeah, and all yeah. of that sort of stuff. You know, drag yeah. culture has has been you know in the pop culture zeitgeist now for generations. It's just now that with the introduction of the likes of RuPaul's Drag Race, where it's now crossed over properly into the mainstream and we're seeing this kind of real emergence of this kind of min, not mini culture but this kind of side culture really coming through now and with the kind of almost divisiveness of politics that's where we're now kind of seeing this shift but one has to remember that because of the likes of the Paul O'Grady as Lily Savage that has been around for generations and you know when one looks at the career of Paul O'Grady one almost has to you, you know look at it as he walked so others now could run. Yeah, exactly. And, and he pioneered that 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 and he that was a art lovely for, ge- man for generations. Well. A sweet man. And a Battersea Dogs Home have named its veterinary hospital after him. Well, I mean, they, were, they he him. was he was an ambassador mm. um, for the home. He was named an ambassador. He became that um, in 2012, and he also became a patron of Orgranton Appeal UK in October of 2015. So you know, he's he what he's only done for animal welfare has been absolutely extraordinary both uh, you know not just through his programs for the love of dogs and and not just and and and, and not just the animal orphans (laughs) programs that we've seen but you know he 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 really put his money where his mouth is and really wanted to go that extra mile with his activism in that way and of course controversially he was um you know left radio two uh when they were he wouldn't. He wouldn't share his show. Good thing too. Um, Sorry. Yeah. Well done, Paul, for that. Yeah, <laughs> and, and that was the start of the beginning of the, you know, uh, an exodus of of, of proper favourite radio two uh, presenters uh, uh, leaving. But he he wouldn't tolerate it. He didn't want to do week on week off. Um, um, with was it was it who was it that he was supposed to be swapping oh, with? Oh, um, oh, it was. I I do I do know this. It's it's going to absolutely bug me. Yeah, we'll find. Uh, blonde Rob Beckett, wasn't it? Rob Beckett. Ro- it was. Well it was Rob Beckett. Was there Rob we go. Beckett. Just just Beckett. came to me. Yeah. Um, yeah, um, but that's the him. thing. Good for him, but also, I mean, very a real shocking death actually. And for all the, I, for all my Irish friends that are listening, of course, uh, Sinead O'Connor yeah. dying in July, age fifty three. Her cause of death is still unknown. Um, of course, known for the nineteen nineties hit, nothing compares to oh. you. But what an artist she was! And I actually, you, you know, she described herself as a protest artist, and she was a real cultural icon, very different to Paul 
Paul O'Grady. Incredible Paul O'Grady voice. was beloved. Sinead yeah. O'Connor was very divisive. I mean, I know she 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 drew attention to a lot of worthwhile causes like racism, child abuse, uh, human rights, organised religion, um, women's rights as well. But you know, she converted to Islam. She did. Well. She converted to Islam. I mean, and also her, we look back at her career. Seven nominated for seven Grammy Awards, winning Best Alternative Music Performance in 1991. She won three MTV Video Music Awards in 1990. She was nominated twice at the Brits for International Solar Artist. She won that award in 1991. But of course, she was no stranger to controversy either. Of course, um, there was the famous incident on SNL Saturday Night Live in 1992. Oh, yeah. She was uh, performing two songs. She performed Nothing Compares to You and then she performed an acoustic ver version of Bob Marley's War. And at the end of that performance, I mean, during that performance, she railed against or uh, highlighted an issue of child abuse. She said, yeah, yeah, child abuse, yeah, yeah, during the song Subhuman Bondage. And then she um, showed up a photo um, that was in her mother's house of the then Pope John Paul II live on television to then she ripped it up and there's a very funny story afterwards because there was then a concert a, a tribute concert to bob dylan celebrating his 30th anniversary um it was at madison square garden just weeks later and you know she was a very controversial figure in the u.s um that performance of Saturday Night Live raised eyebrows, to say the least. There was a real she backlash was against about her. All the, all the young children that have been abused within the Catholic no, no, religion. of course yeah. she was. It, it was a very worthwhile Huge. cause, but at yeah. the time that wasn't so widely known yeah. as it is now. So people saw the, uh, her ripping up the photo of the Pope as a sign of disrespect. And so when she appeared at this Bob Dylan tribute in Madison Square Garden weeks later, she was greeted by a thunderous round of boos. So instead of performing the song that she was due to perform she then performed a screaming version of Bob Marley's war that she performed on Saturday Night Live and then stormed off the stage then but that was that. I mean one has to admire that yeah. the, the courage that it took to do that you know she was almost one of the first dare I say almost uh, you know um so Paul, Paul O'Grady pioneered a lot of things. Sinead O'Connor almost pioneered railing, dare Being I say, angry. railing against yeah. the yeah, cancel yeah. culture. Yeah. The start of cancel yeah. culture before yeah. social media even existed. I mean, it was an absolutely huge controversy at the time. So, I mean, and, and that's the thing, you know, I know she was divisive. I know a lot of the issues, she might have rubbed people up the wrong way. Um, and she was famous for not getting on with Prince, even though Prince... Um, um, Prince wrote the song Nothing Compares yeah. to You and then she was the one that actually made it famous but she and Prince famously didn't get on at all and I know she rubbed up people the wrong way but her achievements in music do speak for themselves and she she she, she will, I think she will cement, forever be she cemented herself in pop culture for for the for the true protest artist that she was um Matthew Perry uh, <sighs> this was um uh, Shocking but not surprising. Shocking but not surprising. I think fans of Friends knew when they saw the reunion episode in 2021, he, he didn't look quite right in that episode. He didn't appeal, appear as his usual self in that episode. Um, of course, known for that worldwide sitcom playing Chanda Bing all throughout the 1990s and the noughties. Um, I mean, he was very his addictions and his struggles his health struggles were very widely known you know even at the age of 24 um he was the youngest age he was the youngest member of the friends cast at the age of 24 in 1994 but already he was already an alcoholic by the age of 14 he became addicted to paracetamol after a jet ski accident in 1997 even um his uh, friends castmates tried to stage an intervention after he would appear um drunk and maybe even high on set um he even paused production of friends for two months in february of 2001 to seek treatment um he nearly died in 2018 after his colon burst that was from years of opioid abuse doctors said at the time that he had a two percent chance wow. 
of survival. Um, it was estimated in 2022 that he had spent nine million dollars on his addiction. So you know, the, these the, these were it, when he died. It was shocking, and again sharp intake of breath he died at the age of 54 um in october on the 28th of that month this year but again everyone had known he, he was very public or at least it it was public knowledge about his health struggles all throughout the years but again you know we look back he is almost a legend i would say almost he is a legend in his own right nominated for a golden globe in 2007 five primetime emmy awards eight screen actors guild awards alongside um the ensemble for the cast for the cast of friends they won together in 1996 uh you know at, at one time him and his friends co-stars they became such a such a success mm. all throughout the world such global icons that they were charging one million dollars per episode and if you think how many friend episode of friends were oh made throughout the years i mean they must have earned an absolute, absolute fortune. fortune it's sad though because we're hearing more about those weeks and months before his yeah. death and it appears that he wasn't quite as clean as yeah despite we despite he was. undergoing yeah. um rehab he it's the cause of sad. death has been named um acute effects of ke of ketamine so he he it appears we can't say it for sure but no. it appears that he was doing other drugs he wasn't as clean as we all thought he was um it, 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 it is a real it is a real shame and also the amount of people that pay tribute to him not just his friends co-stars but people all throughout the industry people like Gwyneth Paltrow that he performed with in London back mm. in the 90s um, on stage you know so so many of of the Hol Hollywood elite should I say paying tribute to him I mean it was a shocking death um, someone that wasn't so shocking but I think just as sad was the late great Glenda Jackson when yeah. she died as well? Because um, she was got a contract. She turned to, to, to politics. In later well, I life. mean, I mean, her career was really quite extraordinary because I mean, throughout the nineteen sixties and 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 the nine and the early seventies, she she was what what we look at likes of Emma Stone and Rachel Weisz now you know that was her then she she won two academy awards of woman in love in 1970 and a touch of class in 1973 nominated for two more she won two baftas in 1979 nominated for four more um the second bafta she won was actually in 2019 three emmy awards one golden globe award nominated for seven more she also won a wow. tony award nominated for four more nominated for five laurence olivier awards she was one of the one of the only actresses to win the american triple crown of acting that is uh you know the the oscar the oscar uh the emmy and also the tony award as well um in 1983 she was given a distinguished service to drama award at the Cannes film festival awarded a cbe in 1979 and then, of course, she she became a um, an MP. She served as an MP for the Labour Party for 23 years, first for Hampstead and Highgate from 1992 until 2010, and then from Hampstead and Kilburn from 2010 I mean, until 2015, we, once the boundaries changed. How did, I mean, how did she even manage to fit that all into her life? I mean, that's extraordinary. To win all of those awards and then to be able to give 20 years to politics. I mean, and then also, and then, of course, to go back to acting because yeah. she, she, she died, own, um, you know, her last movie was released posthumously she um you know she she um it was the great escape of the pathé movie which she starred in with sir michael kane mm -hmm. about the uh world war ii veteran that snuck out of his care home to attend the um the anniversary of the d-day um the the yeah. commemorations of the d-day um of the d-day landings um in france and it was an incredible true story her and sir michael kane they reunited because as you know she as we said she gave a, a, a lot of her life to politics and then you know she reunited with michael kane after I think it was 50 something years you know absolutely extraordinary career and such a such a varied career as well I mean to, to go from because you know every everyone goes oh the Hollywood elite blah loveys darlings whatever mm. but you know she again someone that She's really put worker. her money where her mouth is and I remember actually we got a broadcast exclusive interview with her son Dan Hodges reflecting on his mother's death and um, we had that with Peter Cardwell when we gave a exclusive sneak peek to the great escaper um 
and he and I and I asked Dan at the time, you know, what was she most proud of? Was she proud of her incredible acting career, or or did she really was her true calling politics? And it was very interesting because Dan said, um, you know, there came a time when she was returning to um, acting, and after after surviving decades in Parliament, she looked at her son and said. I don't know if I can do this anymore. Can I do this? Do you think will 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 I be okay to do this? And he said, "Oh, don't be ridiculous, mum. You've you've been in Parliament for years, and and you know you're you're a celebrated actress. It's like riding a bike." And I can say with that movie, it truly was. And she gave an That's absolutely it. sublime performance. Yeah, I haven't in seen that. that yet. I must see that. Other notable um, losses. Uh, I just want to go through a Barry few. Barry Humphreys, of course. Barry Humphreys. Dame Edna. Dame Edna. Uh, absolutely. I met him a couple of times. He was very very. Sweet. He used to sneak in to watch fringe theatre productions. Of course. He can, can I just say, um, if that isn't the most Barry Humphreys thing you've yeah, ever heard, he used to I mean, my just per- sit in the back quietly and watch a lot I'm, of fringe my, stuff. My personal memories of him, did you ever see, and, and this is again, we look at the BBC and, and shows that they used to do compared to shows that they do now. I remember when they did all those shows where they looked for the leads of West End productions, oh, yeah, when yeah. they did How Do You Solve a Problem Like Maria yeah. and I Do Anything for Nancy. Um, um, and then there was the one for Joseph as well and then Over the Rainbow for Dorothy and he actually sat as a judge for some of those programmes and and I just thought and that was my kind of as a young kid in the noughties that was almost my introduction to Barry Humphreys and then I then went and did my research and looked through the archives to see all the Dame Edna stuff of course we lost uh, Jerry Springer as well Jerry Springer, Julian Sands at the age of 65 went wandering off into the mountains and was never seen again and Baroness Betty Boothroyd, to name another. Legend. Uh, and, of course, uh, Lisa Marie Presley, too, at the age of 54. Uh, so many more. I mean, so many more. Uh, Josh, thank you very much indeed. Thank goodness we've still got you. So, <laughs> Josh Rom, their entertainment journalist. Right, stay with me. We're going to talk hedgehogs next. Why not? <laughs> Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. The amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. (laughs) (laughs) That is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you should have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast Ah, on behalf of the Reform UK party. Hi, Ofcom. Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. So yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. 
Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas a terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? With you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. Hello, good afternoon. It is Petri here with you until four o'clock. And then, of course, the marvellous Trisha will be here. I mean, what an absolutely astonishing show we've had today. We've talked about everything, haven't we? Um, we really have. And, and so, so many of you getting in touch has been brilliant. Um, but uh, m most of you now commenting on the conversation we had about the hymen of Plasti and FGM. Uh, and we've still got lots of calls on that. Like I said, I will revisit that topic. It's, um, there seems to be an awful lot more uh, to talk about. Uh, and uh, can I say this? I'll probably get into trouble, but I'm always in trouble. From, um, from, from FGM to talking about things with small pricks. And that is hedgehogs. Uh, hedgehogs. Um, the numbers need to double. Uh, this is what East uh, Sussex rescuers are saying. A hedgehog rehabilitation group has said it cared more uh, for more than twice as many animals in 2023 as it did in the previous year. So what's happening to our hedgehog population? Hugh Warwick, a.k.a. Hedgehog Hugh, joins me now. Hedgehog <laughs> Hugh. Uh, <laughs> uh, hi, hi, Petri. <laughs> you don't look like very spiky at all, you. I mean, you oh, know. you should see me sometimes. Oh, you I look mean, quite, this you is look quite cuddly, actually. Yeah, um... Well, well no, 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 you say that. <laughs> um, but isn't it fascinating? Hedgehog stories popping up all over the place. I love it. Yes, it's it's really interesting. I mean, I I understood that hedgehogs now had had very very quickly learned not to curl up in a ball, and and that they run now. But that is leading no. to running in front of cars. No. no? No, unfortunately, that is is is, is a bit of nonsense. Um, hedgehogs are, are still getting run over at the same rate um, that they were before. It's just that, that you know, there are lots more cars. Now, one of the reasons we see fewer hedgehogs squashed on the roads at the moment is simply because there are fewer hedgehogs out there. They yeah. actually get killed on roads proportional to their population, which is unfortunately one of our more effective tools at identifying population change. It's a survey called Mammals on Roads. Oh, that's sad. Um, amongst many other problems that they face, <laughs> yeah. yes. And it's interesting you talk about having a hedgehog rescue, seeing twice as many hedgehogs you know, this year as the previous year. Uh, and and it, that's interesting. You go, well, maybe that's telling us that there, um, that there are more sick hedgehogs, or maybe it's telling us that there are simply more hedgehogs in the environment, or maybe it's telling us that people care more for hedgehogs and therefore are looking out for them. I mean, certainly the work that I've been doing with the British Hedgehog Preservation Society, of whom I'm a spokesperson, and the People's Trust for Endangered Species, uh, we run a campaign called Hedgehog Street. And we have spent, well, the last, I mean, years, 10, 11 years, uh, pushing the importance of work that can be done to help hedgehogs. And so it's quite possible that the reason more hedgehogs are being taken into a rescue center is because people are simply more aware of when they find a hedgehog and that it's vulnerable. And what, what, I mean, what can we do when we're driving, though, if, if, you know, if, if many of them are still killed on the roads? Because you can't really see them. They're indistinguishable from in country roads from a, you know, a clod of earth. Uh, what, what do we do? Because, I mean, the thought of running one over just is heartbreaking. Um, well, interestingly, the Department of Transport has now made it easier to get uh, hedgehog road signs put up in your community if you feel you've got a hedgehog hotspot. Um, certainly the work that, that I've done, or the analysis I've done looking at uh, problems around Oxfordshire, where I live, is the easiest way is simply making 20 mile an hour speed limits coming into rural villages extend further out into the countryside by just another 100 metres or so. Because what tends to happen is you get to the edge, the hedgehogs will use the edge of the village, they'll wander around the edge of the village, and they will cross the roads around that point. And so if we get people travelling at night simply a little bit slower, then the hedgehogs have a better chance of surviving. I mean, that's really the simplest thing we can do. What about hedgehog tunnels? Should we be thinking about building those? Do they use I mean, them? obviously, 
the the issue is is to do with all sorts of wildlife getting s hammered by the roads mm. um if you look across um if you get, get the, the the big trains going across um uh, the continent or you go across to british columbia in canada you will find that these things called eco ducts are an absolute standard um a really important thing so it's absolutely crucial to start looking at ways of creating corridors across um uh, uh roads to allow hedgehogs to move now tunnels always have a slight problem because yeah they're not actually we don't know how well hedgehogs use tunnels mm -hmm. but we do know a wider eco duct a proper land bridge would be really really useful um we're not the only predator of the hedgehog are we oh no i mean i don't i mean we have been interestingly predators to eat hedgehogs over the years i mean they're, they're, they're famously a dish in fact i um I have a, a recipe in my first book called The Prickly Affair for Hedgehog Spaghetti Carbonara, which got it, its only one-star review on Amazon. Um, so I, mean, I should say it was roadkill. I don't eat meat. Somebody else had cooked it up. Uh, but the, um, no, I mean, so they face a whole host of problems. I mean, the biggest problems they face in our countryside are from the absence of food, in fact. It's interesting, the, the sort of dramatic squashing of a hedgehog on the road or the occasional consumption of a hedgehog by a badger, uh, they, yeah, they're there. But actually, the things which are doing the most damage to hedgehogs are the absence of hedgehog food. Now, hedgehogs are insectivores. They eat prickly bees. Uh, they, they eat the small little bugs and beasts, and it's a fantastic way of you know, keeping a garden a bit safer, too. For, for, um, if you have lots of bugs and beasts around, hedgehogs will be able to feed up. Our farmed landscape, simply because it is inevitable that well, a farmer is going to need stuff, to... Well, yeah. Uh, yeah, but what, it, this isn't a sort of farmer blaming thing. This is very much about recognizing that if you have got a, a sort of food system which is set up requiring farmers to do x and y to make a profit then and that inadvertently kills off hedgehog food um it also kills off farmland bird food um, um bat food a whole host of other animals get uh, affected by it too so we just need to i mean the big picture would be to start looking at the wider ecosystem to look at trying to create a more uh, biodiverse farmed landscape as well as uh, reconnecting uh, our suburban habitat because actually in the surveys that we do um, they show absolutely each time that uh, hedgehogs are doing better in suburbia than they are in the farmed landscape um, the population declined since the year 2000 in our suburban landscapes about 25 percent decline but if you look at the uh, farmed landscape, it's up to a 75% decline just since the year 2000. And it's not unreasonable to extrapolate from that and suggest we've had a population decline of over 90% oh since gosh. the end of the Second World War. That's so, so sad, it, isn't it? And they are. And th to add into this, this is the nation's favourite creature. Mm. Every time there's a vote or a poll for the nation's nature icon or favourite wild animal or whatever, the hedgehog always wins. Now, that really upsets my ornithological friends who think birds are great, but hedgehogs simply are better. Uh, and, and it's something, I think there's something about the hedgehog which plays deep into the, into the sort of the British character. Well, it's a Mrs. Tiggywinkle, isn't it, and all of that? We've got it, absolutely, yeah. we've got it tied in with, interestingly, before 1905, I think it was, when uh, Mrs. Tiggywinkle came out, the Beatrix Potter story, um, hedgehogs tended to be um, animals of portent and doom. She, she switched them around. She oh, wow. was the PR guru for hedgehogs. I mean, we, have, we owe her a great deal. <laughs> in fact, she's now, yeah, we, we now rely on Pam Ayres. Uh, yeah, we do. Um, briefly, <laughs> what can we do in our gardens um, to, first of all, attract to hedgehogs or, mm -hmm. or if they're already there to, to protect them? Okay, the very first thing is to make sure the hedgehogs can get in. Um, and so small 13 centimetre holes cut in the bottom of fences to allow, obviously talk to your neighbours first. This is the essence of the hedgehog street campaign. Talk to your neighbours, make the hole, get them talk to their neighbours, make the hole, spread hedgehog love down a hedgehog street and then have a hedgehog street party. I've in fact organised two hedgehog bake-offs though we did have to turn somebody away. You're not baking hedgehogs too, though. Yeah, no, yeah. no, we're not <laughs> taking <laughs> hedgehog cakes in the shape of hedgehogs. Either. Um, but the best thing to do to help hedgehogs in your garden is simply get rid of the cult of tidiness just stop trying to control your garden stop trying to make it neat and tidy leave some bits of your garden to go wild share a bit of the garden they would with love nature. my garden i haven't touched oh fantastic well, this is it we should we should come round. <laughs> have, have you got any hedgehogs in your garden no sadly i'm surrounded by walls my garden okay well so, then get a big drill scale. and Make yeah. a hole. Make okay. a hole. All right, I'll um, ask my and neighbour, and she will say yes. Actually, she will. Okay, I would just have a Google for Kurtlington Wildlife 
um, and Conservation Society, and they've got videos on there. They've made ladders, staircases, and, and, and great big sort of slides for hedgehogs to get between mm -hmm. gardens, which have got raised differences between the heights. It's absolutely amazing what you can do. And there's a whole thing, if you build it, they might come. So oh, make know. a hole, make a hole, be less tidy, and then enjoy. I get videos sent to me all the time. Um, there's a Hedgehog Highways Facebook group. People sitting in their gardens of an evening, having a glass of wine in the summer. Obviously, hedgehogs are hibernating now. And you know, they're having a glass of wine with their friends. And hedgehogs will snuffle across, walk across their toes to get to a feeding bowl with some extra food put in it. You, I mean, it is like the best wildlife experiences you'll get. And I've been out in Africa looking, you know, looking for the big, the big beasties. I get my best fun in a garden with a hedgehog. Oh, but I, I'm not surprised. Just had one of my uh, viewers ask uh, if fewer people are chucking out the plastic from four uh, cans, uh, packs of beer, because um, at one point they were killing hedgehogs. I always, if I have any of those, I always cut them. Yeah, absolutely. That was an amazing advertising campaign somebody did years and years ago, telling people to cut them. Interestingly, now, most beer cans, or, or the beer I see, is sold either with cardboard around them or with glue in between the cans. People are learning about the risks of, of rubbish. We've had it continually. I mean, elastic bands dropped by uh, postal workers. Yeah. Um, they, oh, kill, yeah. they kill and maim hedgehogs. Um, we've had, we had a long-running battle with McDonald's, uh, the British Hedgehog Preservation Society. It took us eight years, but we got there in the end, and they changed the shape of their McFlurry cup because hedgehogs were pushing their noses into them. And because all their spines lie backwards, they then couldn't pull their heads out. Um, but actually, the simple thing is, and I do hundreds of talks uh, each year, uh, often go into primary schools, and you talk to the children and you say, you know, do you drop litter? And most of those children don't drop litter. It's when they get slightly older that they do. They need to have it inculcated in them right from the very start that dropping litter isn't just messy. It's not just about grown-ups going, oh, don't be messy. It's because dropping litter kills wildlife. It's such a brilliant thing. Um, I have loved this. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> uh, cuddly Hedgehog Hugh uh, there, who is Hugh Warwick. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, right, well, that's almost it from uh, me, isn't it, today? So let's, let's have a quick chat with um, Trisha, because she's coming up next. Uh, Trisha, what a joy. Hello, hello, Petri. I hope you had a happy Christmas. That was so interesting. Wasn't it? I, I was surprised that. by that as well. I thought it was going to be a bit cute, Yay. but it was good. It was good. Yeah, I did, but I was like, wow, who knew? <laughs> um, well, I guess we've got a few wow, he knew, uh, well, Hugh knew. Hugh <laughs> knew when he told us all about them. <laughs> All right. Da, 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 da. Um, you, you know, um, I'm going to be talking about the fact that about a third of the world's population lives on, in a country country under some kind of economic sanction. Really interesting to see what sanctions have done. It's something that uh, started after the First World War. 2023 has been uh, a bumper year for sanctions, so we're going to be looking at whether they're successful or not. Uh, the OBEs and the gongs and what have you. Uh, some of the unsung heroes I'm going to be uh, talking about. And gleaning. Do you know what gleaning is? I mean, it's a term that goes back to biblical times and apparently the equivalent of 18 million meals a week in the UK goes to waste because oh. farmers, you know, they, their potatoes are a bit knobbly and what have you, uh, they're, they're wasted. Well, there's a new movement to bring those meals and, and harvest all of those things that are thrown out uh, to feed Britain. And it's something that people can get involved with. Uh, it brings together camaraderie and it feeds people with fresh fruit, food and fruit other than tin fruit. It's so we're disgusting. going to be looking at that. It's disgusting when they throw these things away or they weren't, they're not, yeah, they're they not perfect, the knobbly fruit or the knobbly, you know, veg. I, I, yeah, it's yeah. horrific that they're throwing them away because once you cut them up, who cares? Exactly. Who cares? Who cares? But uh, it's a way of feeding people yeah. with stuff that would normally, the tons and tons of food that's normally thrown out every week because it doesn't look pretty enough for the supermarket shelves. Crazy. It's absolute madness. Uh, it sounds absolutely fantastic as you are, uh, Trisha. And I will see you tomorrow because oh, I'm here tomorrow as well. So I will see you then. Um, listen, I've got to tell you about this. This is in celebration of his much deserved MBE. Don't miss a special programme tonight here on Talk TV. It's about the life and career of uh, our very